afternoon and welcome. I will call order for the June 18th meeting for the Merida City Council is now called to order. Madam City Clerk, can you please call roll to determine a quorum? Council Member DeForest. Council Member Lavelle. Here. Council Member Holliday. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Warren. Here. Mayor Stone. Present. And let the record reflect that all members are present. Thank you, Madam City Clerk. Madam City Clerk, are there any public comments on closed session items only? Seeing none. Thank you. Madam City Clerk, would you please go over the closed session agenda? Absolutely. Um, the City Council will meet in closed session, conference with real property negotiator, um, conduct a closed session pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.8 to enable the City Council to consider negotiations and to give direction to its negotiators regarding that certain real property, a portion of which is contained within or adjacent to parcel number 963060086 in the City of Murrieta. The city's real property negotiators, the city manager, assistant city manager, and city attorney will seek direction from the city council regarding price and terms for this property. The city council will also conduct a closed session CS2 pursuant to government code section 54956.8 to enable the city council to consider negotiations and to give direction to its negotiators regarding certain real property located at northwest corner of Linnell Lane and Whitewood Road, APN 392-290048 with the same real property negotiators and the city council um, will see, they, they will seek direction from the council regarding price and terms for that property. City council will also meet in CS3, conducting a closed session pursuant to government code section 54956D2. There is a significant exposure to litigation in one case. The city council will also meet in CS4, conducting a closed session pursuant to go government code section 54957.6 with the city manager, city attorney, and city's negotiators regarding labor negotiations with the Murrieta General Employees Association and the Murrieta Supervisors Association. And lastly, the city council will hold a closed session with the city's personnel officer, city manager, pursuant to government code section 54957 and 957.6A to conduct an employee performance evaluation of the city manager and to discuss salary, compensation, and fringe benefits provided to the city manager. That concludes closed session items. Thank you so much. And with that, we're going to re recess to closed session and we will reconvene at 6 p.m. for the regular meeting. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to call the June 4th meeting, regular meeting with the Marietta City Council is now called to order. Announcement of closed session items. Madam City Attorney, please provide a report from closed session. Thank you, Mayor. The City Council met in closed session on five items. The first was to confer with the real property negotiator regarding property um, known as APN 963-060-086. On this item, the Council was updated, no reportable action. The second item was also to confer with real, the real property negotiator regarding property known as APN 392-290-048. On this item, there was also no reportable action. The council was updated. The third item was to confer with legal counsel regarding um, significant exposure to litigation in one case pursuant to government code section 54956.92. In this item, again, council was updated, no reportable action. The fourth item was to confer with labor negotiators pursuant to government code section 54957.6 regarding negotiations with two union or two labor groups. In this item, the council, again, was updated, no reportable action. The last item was to conduct a public employee performance evaluation regarding the city manager pursuant to government code sections 54957 and 54957.6A. Again, the council was updated, no reportable action. Thank you. Thank you, Madam City Attorney. Madam City Clerk, can you please call a roll to determine a quorum? Council Member DeForest. Council Member Lavelle. Here. Council Member Holliday. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Warren. Present. Mayor Stone. Present. Let the record reflect all members are present with the exception of Council Member DeForest with an excused absence. Thank you, Madam City Clerk. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? <laughs> led by Ms. Vega, and remain standing for the invocation led by Reverend Melissa Russler with the Marietta Unified Methodist Church. Repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America 
and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let us pray. Gracious and ever-present God, how grateful we are for this day. We pray for your presence among us to remind us of our diversity, our differences, and our similarities. We pray, O oh God, for your work among us, for your care to be among your council members and city staff and all those who watch over and protect us. We pray that you would guard our hearts and guide our mouths, that our speech might reflect care and character for those around us. And on those places where we agree, let us celebrate. And on those places where we disagree, let, we, let us disagree with grace and care. Watch over the business that is before us and give us wisdom and discernment. And we give you thanks, O oh God, for the place in which we live and the ways in which we get to celebrate. And all of this and all things, we pray, O oh God, in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mrs. Vega, and thank you, Reverend Rustler. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to move on to presentations. Madam City Clerk. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So we have the retirement of Sandra Valle, police officer. Woo -hoo. Um, so if you would like Sandra to come up, Madam Mayor, um, yeah, yes. that would be um, great. Yes, Madam City Clerk, before um, I present the proclamation, I understand that there are some folks in the audience that would like to say a few words on behalf of Sandra. So Madam City Clerk. Thank you for that. So I have um, Mr. Dennis Bruman, please. <laughs> uh, good evening. Uh, is, would it be inappropriate for to have Sandy come up here? No, or? please, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I love the shirt, but I'm not going to call 911 and, and, uh, and interrupt the phone lines there. But uh, I just want to say I had a distinct pleasure to work with Sandy here at Murrieta PD for several years. I, in fact, uh, I was on your interview panel when you first uh, interviewed. Sandy worked at LAPD and was interested in coming over to Murrieta, and I thought that she would be... And he denied me the first time. I had to apply twice. Did you? Oh, I don't remember that. I don't remember that. You remember that. Uh, but anyways, long ways, it worked out great because she came out here and, and you made such a great difference in serving the community. And of course, if you can't tell, she's got a nickname, Big Red. And I don't know why they call her that, but it, just the coworkers in a loving way. But even the, even the crooks out there called you that. And, and so um, she was not afraid to get her hands dirty and go to work. So as soon as she got out of briefing, okay. she would go out there and look for things to basically... You know, how do I proactively solve crime? And so some cops do it better than others, but she was the best at doing things uh, that way. And <laughs> and you can tell she's very popular because there's many other current uh, Murrieta PD employees and retirees here to support her because we love you. And I just want to tell you, she would come into my office and give me all kinds of suggestions and things like that. And <laughs> she was never short of a list of things that needed improvement. But I tell you what, she had some great ideas, and we implemented a lot of things. And I always appreciated your honesty and your willingness to come forward. And I, I just respect you. And I'm glad that you asked me to come uh, here tonight with you. So congratulations on your retirement. Retirement's a good thing. Uh, you're going to enjoy it. You just ask any of the people here in the fr uh, first few rows, uh, but well-deserved. Thank you so much. Mr. Kasson Klein. What do you mean, uh-oh? Uh -oh. <laughs> 
Um, I was telling Jim Janiszek, you know, seeing all the officers that are here, current and retired, it's not unprecedented, but it is uncommon. Uh, I've, I've attended a, a lot of retirements for police officers, and um, this speaks a lot. And at retirements, we hear a lot from staff members and colleagues, but I'm here tonight to speak to you as a resident and someone who um, had an experience with, with Sandra. Um, you know, often if you read uh, social media, you'll hear about how Sandra was on Extra Patrol and Ginger Powers Unite. <laughs> um, you know, many of you have heard me talk about my son's struggles. Um, and at one of his <clears throat> lowest points, I was sitting at my desk, and he came out of the bathroom with a knife to his throat. And he said, Dad, I don't want to live. Um, we went downstairs. We went outside. We sat in front of the house. And because of his run-ins with police officers, um, he didn't like them. And when he saw them, he would run. And so uh, I managed to communicate with dispatch. And, you know, I had told them, look, when you send an officer to the house, you got to enter you got to approach from this side so he doesn't see you. And so my son and I were sitting out front, and around the corner comes Sandra. And um, the look on Chase's face um, was not only one of shock that here is a police officer in uniform, but it was almost in, in a, I could see almost re relief from him. Um, I see Travis here. I saw Travis here earlier. Travis was also uh, an officer that responded and, and handled that situation uh, professionally and compassionately. And so, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Mr. Jonathan Ingram. <laughs> so I'm biased because I love Marietta PD. Our, our police department is amazing, right? Great round of applause for our department. I love the big paper head over there, big red, right? First time we had the opportunity to work together was in Greer Ranch. And I remember everybody going, well, Marietta PD's here, and I look up, and here comes this officer playing no games at all, said, this is what you're going to do, this is how you're going to do it. Did it compassionately, but she is the example of what law enforcement is supposed to be. <laughs> and, and if you think for one second, because she's of the female persuasion that you're going to get away with any crap, you are going to find something out differently very quickly that this person didn't put up with anything. We were standing in a parking lot. And you might remember this. Actually, you were still in your car. I was talking to you. I won't talk about the location. But you looked over and you said, Mayor, I got to go. And you drove over 50 feet away. Do you remember this? And she spotted somebody out of the corner of her eye as she was speaking to me, detained them, and wound up having an arrest afterward. This, this lady is law enforcement. She's a bloodhound, and she got things done. And I think it's, it's going to be a loss to see you leave. And we love you. Madam Mayor, that, con that concludes public comment. Thank you, Madam City Clerk. Sandra, why don't you come back up? <laughs> you can have it stand right at the podium if you like. Okay. Sandra Valle, is that correct? I actually got it right. Um, before I read this, I do want to share with you when I have requested to do a ride along, everybody says, oh, you got to ride along with Big Red. And even though I did, never had the opportunity to do it, um, I hear you have been an absolutely amazing um, peace officer and you're very well respected. So I just wanted to share those few things with you. 
So whereas Sandra Valle's father was a strong influence and taught Sandra always to do right, which she carried throughout her career. Whereas Sandra Valle has over 20 years of public service, her career started with the Los Angeles Police Department and joined the city of Marietta in 2007, where she will retire as a police officer. And whereas Sandra Valle volunteers her time once a month with Helping Hands, an organization that feeds elderly people on fixed low income, and whereas after 17 years of public service to the city, Sandra Valle will always be part of the Marietta family. And as such, we congratulate Sandra Valle on her retirement and wish her the best of luck in all her future endeavors. Now, therefore, let it be resolved that the City Council of the City of Marietta does hereby commend Sandra Valle for her service and dedication to the residents of Marietta dated this day, 18th of June, 2024. And Sandra, typically just the mayor signs a certificate, but all five council members have signed this. And so we wanna congratulate you, but before we come down to take a picture with you, our city manager has a few things that she would like to say. Thank you on behalf of the city. Um, your legend will live on. Everything that ever said about you is so true. And I hear it from everyone wherever you go. So you will be missed. And here is your watch. Oh, yay. <laughs> So before we come down and take a, a lovely picture with you, we were wondering if you'd like to say a few words. Oh, I'd love to. <laughs> um, it's so good to see so many of my coworkers here. Retired, big Dave Lawler. Somebody wake him up. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we can go into the pants on the ground, sorry. <laughs> Jeff Van Wick, he's clean shaven. That's so sweet. <laughs> Condition cleared up. Condition cleared up. I don't see the chief here, but that's not unexpected. Anyway, I just wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, Larry Preston. Oh my God, our air support sergeant. <laughs> thank you for coming. I'm honored. Just want to say thank you all. Thank, well, number one, thank God for 28 years of safety on patrol. Yes, amen. Yeah, he kept me safe from dirtbags, parolees, and admin. And <laughs> uh, and you, you guys, I mean, all my coworkers and my, my, my knuckle draggers, I love y'all. And thank y'all so much for backing me on all my parolee flag downs when They'd wave at me and want to talk to me for some reason. Um, coming out with me when I had, you know, people who had warrants that dispatch told me about that I wasn't really with. But you always backed me. I love you all, and I, I know what, what it means that we're all... Craig Sandrick. I thought you got fired. Um, <laughs> he saved my life from a spider one day. He did. He did. In Bridgewater. Oh, Bridgewater. I don't know where I am. Um, anyway, I love you all. It's been a wonderful time the last 17 years here. And uh, like I said, we're all family. I know you guys don't do this for recognition except me today. So acknowledge me, recognize me, appreciate me. <laughs>
Okay, moving on to the approval of the agenda. Are there any changes to the approval of the agenda? Seeing none, Madam Mayor. I apologize. <laughs> Based off of the look I got. <laughs> um, actually, um, Madam Mayor, I, I believe you may have a request, but other than that? Yes. Okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are going to <laughs> pull item number 19. We're going to postpone it. And I would like to ask for consensus from my colleagues to have a workshop at a future meeting so we can have the experts from both sides to answer all of our questions. Do I have consensus? Yes. 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 We have consensus. Madam City Clerk. So with that, um, do we have an approval for the agenda? So we have a motion. Thank you, Council Member Holliday. If I can get a second. There we go. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. Please vote. Motion carries unanimously, 4-0. Thank you, Madam City Clerk. Moving on to City Manager Administrative Update. The City Manager Administrative Updates is the opportunity for the City Manager to provide community updates as well as department or commission announcement on current or upcoming projects. Madam City Manager. Thank you, Mayor, Council. First, we're going to have Isaac Bravo, a management analyst in the City Manager's office, and he's going to give you a brief update on some of the things related to Cal Recycle. Hi, good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. Um, first, I'd like to provide you a little bit of background, then what the city's done, and then what challenges the city's gonna face as far as SB 1383 implementation and Cal Recycle. Um, so a little bit of background, SB 1383 is landmark uh, legislation uh, as it relates to solid waste and solid waste services. Uh, Really, it is a fundamental shift in how we see food waste, not as waste, but as a resource, which is a very hard thing to do. Um, the legislation itself had two uh, main items. First, it's diversion from landfills. It's at a 50% diversion by 2022 and a 75% diversion by 2025. And food rescue or food recovery from tier one and tier two generators. Um, the city was under a corrective action plan as of January 25th, 2023, but we've done several things to meet that plan and better our standing with CalRecycle. So this city council in March of 2023 adopted a resolution in the second amendment to our franchise agreement, which allowed residents of the city to use the landscape bin, which was the green bin that most residents had, um, as an organic waste receptacle. That met the compliance of the law, but we were notified by waste management there were about 1,400 residents in districts two, uh, three, and five, um, mainly in HOAs that did not have any sort of recycling or organic bins. Uh, staff worked with CalRecycle to extend the corrective action plan to March 1st of 2024, um, and we worked with the HOAs very closely. It was six HOAs that we did outreach with, um, and town hall meetings with them to kind of educate them on the requirements of the law and kind of get them on board um, in conjunction with waste management. Uh, waste management has been a wonderful partner in getting uh, the city into compliance. Um, the cap was met uh, and completed on March 1st of 2024. Um, in addition, the city has been proactively working with MSW to do a digital implementation record, which is a requirement under the legislation, as well as entering into an agreement with the uh, Western Riverside Council of Governments, WRCOG, for food rescue and food rescue organization monitoring. So we've worked with them. Um, they have a great app um, through that's called Carrot. 
it basically works, as lack of a better term, it's kind of like Tinder for um, food rescue organizations and for um, the uh, partners. And so really it makes a contract for both of them. They put up and the, the food generator says, we have X amount of food. And then the recipient can come in, say, we'll go pick it up. And it works out the contract all digitally, all online. And that's being provided at no cost to the businesses within Marietta through this agreement with WRCOG. Um, so that's what's been done. Um, we are compliant to date, um, but we do have some challenges for what's next. And the biggest challenge that we're going to be facing is procurement, AB 1895, uh, I'm sorry, AB 1985, um, extended procurement targets. The city is required to meet a procurement goal for compost, mulch, and renewable energy uh, by 2025, 100%. It's based on our population. We will be bringing something back to you at a later date. We're still going through and valuing what alternatives are available to the city. But as of this point in time, we're OK with CalRecycle, and we've met our requirements. So really what I do want to uh, get the message out to residents is you have these containers available to you. Please use them appropriately. There will be fines that will be coming through on bills if they are not um, used appropriately. We're only monitoring the green containers, so please make sure that there's no plastics in those green containers, and you will not see a fine. Um, and with that, I'm open to any questions that you might have. Great. Any questions? Seeing none. Madam City uh, Manager, I, ha I do have one question. Um, in our magazine that we sent, I think, twice a year, are we, are we putting this information in that magazine? Yes, we are. Very good. Thank and you. A weird thing, we're sending out a brochure in the next two months. Yes, because we've gotten off schedule with the magazines. So you'll see a much smaller one, but then the regular magazine will come out. So yes, we've been pushing this out um, on social media as well. Fantastic, thank you so much. Thank you, Isaac. Next, we're going to have special events supervisor, Laura Frasso and she's going to give a special event update. Yep. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of the City Council. Nice to see you guys today. Uh, summer is a very busy month for us in Parks and Recreation, Department of Fun, as Brian likes to say. Uh, last weekend, we held the 53rd Father's Day Car Show at California Oaks Sports Park. We had a great day with a lot of families, uh, over 300 classic and specialty vehicles, we gave out 46 trophies that you see there on the slide. And uh, the best in show uh, was won by that beautiful 36 Ford Roadster owned by Patrick Jones. And that car will be on the back of all the shirts next year. And um, we had a great day. Thank you for those here and over here that uh, I saw at the car show. It was, it was a fabulous day. Uh, this coming weekend, Newman Hospitality Group is hosting the Old Town Music Fest at Town Square Park and Amphitheater. Um, they have a great lineup, and tickets are on sale. If you were to go to MarietaAmphitheater.com, there is a link. Um, I know I'm super excited to see uh, Kofi Anderson on uh, Sunday. If you go to the next slide, I think I have who's uh, performing. Uh, there's Randy Hauser is on Saturday. Um, there's... Actually, he might be on Sunday. I think he, yeah, he's on Sunday. Brian Kelly from Florida Georgia Line is on Saturday. But they have a great lineup. They have uh, a lot of tickets to sell. So if anyone's interested, please join me. I will be there as well. Uh, the following weekend is the city uh, celebrating their 33rd birthday. We'll be over at Cal Oak Sports Park uh, starting at 2. We'll have some inflatables like a kid zone. Um, we will have the firefighters host down at 430 we will have our opener, which is Petty Breakers, the tribute to Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers at five. We'll have Divas of Rock, which is a tribute to Heart, Pat Benatar, Stevie Nicks um, at seven. And then we will end the evening with our 18 minute fireworks show at nine. We have a lot of vendors and hopefully the weather will be nice to us and we'll have a great day. Um, I did want to mention that California Oaks Road for the first time will be closed during the birthday bash from Lincoln to Jackson Avenue. Uh, we have notified all of the businesses in that center right there. We've tried to notify um, 
you know, the residents via social media and things like that. Obviously, uh, the police department and fire department um, are well aware and part of uh, the reason why we are closing the road um, for safety. Um, so plan your route accordingly, but we do hope to see everyone at the birthday. And uh, last, sat every Saturday in July, we have our Concerts in the Park series. It's a free series. Uh, we have plenty of space there at Town Square Park Amphitheater. Uh, July 6th, we'll have Brothers Igniting a Groove. Uh, July 13th, we will have Cheese Whiz. July 20th, we'll have Echoes of Cadence. And July 27th, we will have uh, Stevie Nicks Illusion, which is a tribute to Fleetwood Mac. Um, these are presented by a noble realty in Rancho Water. We appreciate their sponsorship. And again, this is a free event, seven to nine, so Saturdays in July, and we hope uh, everyone will join us. And that is all the events we have coming just for the next few months. We have more in August and September, but uh, we just wanted to bring the next few to your attention. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them for you. Laura, um, with regards to the road closure between <clears throat> Lincoln and Jackson, is that gonna be all day or just during from two to nine? Um, it's gonna be a little bit before and a little bit after okay. because we are putting food vendors on the road. Oh. So I believe it's starting at noon and it's okay. going till 10. And then the food vendors know that we do need to reopen the road at that time and they need okay. to be off the okay. street. Great, thank you. Any other questions from my colleagues? Seeing none, thank, thank you very much. Thank and you. also, real fast, I just wanna say thank you. <laughs> I just wanna say thank you to your entire team. It was so hot on Saturday for the car show and they weathered right through it. So thank, thank you. Thank them we, all for we us. We actually, real quick, we, we had one year where it was 117. Oh so God. this weekend was perfect. Yeah. No it, problem. It, it was no hot. Thank you. thank you, Laura. And next we will have our public information officer, Christina Davies, come up and give you a community report update. Well, hello, Mayor and Council. So normally I do a bit of the events, but Laura covered that. And I want you guys to know we've also been uh, talking about the road closure. Um, we're gonna be putting that on our social media accounts and that went out in our uh, monthly newsletter and it is also on the website. So we do have that road closure up there. So what else is going on in the city of Marietta? Well, the, uh, for us, we have at the end of the month on June 25th, we have our coffee with the city. So for people who are watching or online or people in the audience today, um, if you wanna meet with our city leaders, we will be um, at the Marietta Innovation Center on Tuesday at 8.30 in the morning. And this is just a chance for the community to come out, talk with our um, elected officials as well as um, uh, as well as our um, executive team. And that's gonna be at 8.30 at the Marietta Innovation Center. And the address is up on the screen. Job opportunities, we have a public safety dispatcher um, opening as well as a recreation leader part-time. And I put the um, address up there for mariettaca.gov forward slash jobs. And of course, I'm not gonna leave here without telling everybody you should sign up for our newsletter, uh, follow us on our social media accounts because that is a great way for us to get the information out there because of course we are connected by community. Any questions? Any questions? Seeing none, thank you so much. Thank you, Christina, that's all I have. Thank you, Madam City Manager. Moving on to governing body commission, committee board reports. The governing body reports is the opportunity for the city council to provide a brief report on conferences, seminars, commission, committees, boards, and meeting attendance. Council Member Lavelle. None of my committees met, so I have nothing for you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Council Member Holliday. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Madam Mayor and I attended the Code Enforcement Ad Hoc Committee subcommittee meeting, and they probably regret putting me on that committee after I got done picking through the punctuation and stuff in the code. <laughs> um, but we're off to a good start and look forward to improving that. Thank you so much, Council Member Holliday. MPT Warren. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I did attend the, um, <clears throat> pardon me, the Riverside County Transportation Commission, also known as the RCTC, um, on the 12th of June. Uh, the uh, full board approved the proposed fiscal year budget for 24-25 and the Western Riverside County Measure A Specialized Transit Program, that is for the nonprofits in Riverside County. We approved that, we called for project awards, and we awarded over $9 million in projects. And that concludes my report. 
Thank you, MPT Warren. And as Councilmember Holliday said that I joined him at our ad hoc committee for code enforcement. And at this time, we don't have any updates for you. Moving on to public comments. This is for non-agenda items. Any person may address a governing bodies on any subject pertaining to city business. Normally, no action may be considered or taken by the governing bodies on any matter not listed on the agenda. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. Requests for more, more time must be made to the city clerk with the timing limited to a maximum of six minutes. Madam City Clerk, are there any public comments? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have Steve Corona. Mayor Stone, members of the council, my name is Steve Corona. Um, typically you would see me dressed a little differently when I come here. I'm a Thank you. board member of the Eastern <laughs> Municipal Water District, but I'm here today to talk to you as a uh, recycled water ratepayer and farmer in Temecula. Um, I'm here to ask that the, uh, that the Murrieta City Council consider protesting the proposed recycled water rate increases uh, by the Rancho California Water District. Uh, the, the rates, uh, the monthly rates that they are proposing to me are outrageous. Um, in, in many ways, they are the highest rates that I have ever seen, obviously. And as you know, many times, or most of the time, when wa water rates go up, they don't ever come back down again. Um, I, I gave you a list of, of their proposed increases for the Santa Rosa Division. There is the, the Rancho Division and the Santa Rosa Division. The Rancho Division typically takes care of the, uh, the Temecula area, and the increases on, in the Temecula area are higher than they are in Murrieta. If you look at, at the rate structure over the next three years, uh, the rates will be going up substantially, sometimes two and three times. In fact, if you look at the rate increases for six inches and eight inch meters, which is what our golf courses and some of our parks use, they are going up some, sometimes a thousand percent. I've been to the um, workshop provided by Rancho. Um, I, you know, I go to all their meetings as a, as a board member of Eastern, um, but uh, I felt in, in, in this case I had to say something about it. And so I, uh, it would be great if we if if we could get a protest on a Prop 218 hearing. If the protest is over 51 percent of the of the meters, uh, the rate increase would not go through. So with that, I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Kassen Klein. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, we are at a crossroads, or we're going to be here very shortly. I'm concerned with the institutional knowledge that's going to be leaving and that has left the city. Um, with the retirement of Ivan recently, um, and with Kim's retirement soon, that's going to leave um, a big void with institutional knowledge. Um, I think that leaves Kristen with roughly two years here and Justin being brand new. Um, and with that said, um, f f well, what I'm gonna focus on, there, there's many reasons, but um, looking forward, uh, at the end of the year, you all are going to consider who's gonna sit in that middle chair. And we had a policy adopted several years ago um, I won't go into it, um, that I think needs to be repealed. Um, with the absence of the institutional knowledge, it's my opinion that it is going to take, um, well, it, it's gonna be extremely important that we have a steady guiding hand in that center chair. I recognize that it's one vote, um, but if for nothing else, um, 
for the appearance of the public and for those wanting to do business here, um, I, I think it's important. And I'll leave it at that. There's many other things that we can talk about. Um, well, I'm going to go into one of them. With the policy, uh, there's an expectation. And with that expectation, unfortunately, uh, there has been some embarrassment for some. Um, starting with Council Member Bennett, when it was expected that she was going to be named mayor. Her family was here. Um, they brought flowers. Staff had the expectation. They had bought her flowers. Um, and it didn't happen. And it was an embarrassment for her and her family. I think it was probably an embarrassment for staff. Um, wasn't a good look for the city. Uh, then there was the case of, of Council Member Ingram. Um, similar thing occurred. So um, I, I think having the policy will, or, or doing away with the policy will avoid that expectation and the potential for those embarrassing moments. But overall, like I said, with the absence of that institutional knowledge, it's going to be imperative that we have someone with a steady and guiding hand in that center seat. Thank you. Mr. Allen Long. So do I, do I have six minutes or three minutes for both items? Three minutes for both items. Okay. Well, I'll briefly comment on what was an agenda item 19 that got pulled. I drove four and a half hours uh, to come here and speak on it, and you pulled it. Uh, so I asked the question, who are you here for? There's an audience. Uh, we don't get the, the liberty. You know, we have schedules, too. We're not here every week. So um, I will comment on the way that was written. Um, it was written with a resolution where you had one choice to support opposing a Taxpayer Protection and Accountability Act. Um, I would encourage you, and, I, and Mayor Stone, I completely agree with you that in the future that a workshop be done so you can have both sides. The resolution was completely one-sided. The attachments and the supporting documentation was propaganda from, from what agency. Be nice to hear both sides. I can't say that whether I'm for it or against it. I don't, it'd take a pretty good sale for for you to get me to support something like that, but um, I, I think the voters should have a say in whether taxes and fees are raised. Second item, with what Kasson was on, in August 3rd, 2010, the rotation uh, was amended and had a, a fairness in mind due to the, the bickering of last, past council members. And in August 3rd, 2010, an item was added that included seniority to that rotation. After that, um, we met in April of 2012. I was on the council and I pointed out that the rotation math did not work. It mathematically did not work if fairness was in mind and you were trying to give everyone a shot at the mayor role. The council, we had a two hour discussion. I just watched it again today, it was painful. Sorry we put you through that. It was math, they, everyone agreed and acknowledged that mathematically it did not work, but there was always the set aside. The set aside was, well, we can, we can set the, the rotation aside and then we can choose whomever we want for those situations. What also was said is, and the future council will fix this because we need something in place for, a few, for the fairness of the rotation and the future council can do whatever they want. Well, it's never been fixed. And as, as Mr. Klein indicated, you had two scenarios. It was very embarrassing. Every time since that policy has been in place, the mayor rotation has become a political hot potato. Feelings get hurt. It's been used as a political tool because if you don't honor the rotation, then there must be a reason why. They don't like that person or there's bad politics in play. Take that rotation out of the system. The qualifications for mayor is incumbent on the people to elect those who they feel fit to sit in that chair, whether it's a council member or the ceremonial position as mayor, because there's no more power. That's the qualification 
The voters put you in the seat, do away the rotation, put who you think is best in that time that you need a mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Mayor, I have a request um, with some donated time for Jim Janoshik. And he's with the Rotary Club. <laughs> I'm, I'm the, Dr. Jim Janoshik. I'm representing the Rotary Club, putting the Rotary Field of Honor hat on figuratively and um, <laughs> literally. Um, I want to uh, stand up here as a representative of the Field of Honor, a city signature event, and our partnership with the Murrieta Rotary Club, the Old Town Temecula Club, as well as the city. This year's Field of Honor will take place on November 9th through the 16th. The Field of Honor is a week-long celebration of heroes. Those heroes can include the military, which are active duty, veterans, even retired first responders, teachers, coaches, any mentors. We honor any hero in your life. And we do that by sponsoring flags. We put up in City uh, Town Square Park over 2,000 flags, and we have a week-long celebration of events. We have sponsorships of those flags that raise money, as well as sponsorships for the Field of Honor. All money raised goes right back into the community and in our magazine, we have a full page of over the 30 different projects that we fund through this uh, field of honor. During this week, uh, coming year, on Saturday, November 9th, we will be setting up the field. No, Sunday, November 10th, we'll continue with the Volbrick Memorial Chalk Art um, e Exhibition, as well as the Marine Corps birthday will be on Sunday. This Monday, will be the Veterans Day Parade, which is attended by tens of thousands. Um, Tuesday, we start our fifth grade visits. In the Murrieta Valley School Unified School District, that's when they learn about American history and patriotism. Years ago, Stan Shear, the superintendent said, when he was setting, finished setting up the field, says, my kids need to know this. So during the fifth grade visits, there are stations. There are um, six stations, and we are hoping to add two more, the Murrieta Through Time, as well as the new Vietnam Memorial. Um, Wednesday, we, we'll have a veterans luncheon, as well as a candlelight ceremony and reading of the letters of war. On Friday, we hope to have a sponsor reception, also helping dedicate our Murrieta Through Time, as well as a Boy Scout flag retirement ceremony. And then the following weekend, we'll tear that all down. So as part of that, because of your long 16 year, this will be our 16th year um, promotion and partnership, we'd like to present to the city council a sponsor book. Mayor? Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ms. Amy Edgeworth. Good evening, esteemed members of the Murrieta City Council, city staff, and cherished residents of our beautiful city. I'm Amy Edgeworth, founder of Pearl Center for Creative Arts, and tonight I'm excited to share some highlights from our already action-packed summer. First, thank you to the over 130 community members who joined us for summertime stories in the garden at the amazing Murrieta Public Library. I read How to Move a Train or Eat a Whale, a tribute to Shel Silverstein's classic poem, Melinda May. It was truly off the rails, get it? 
But seriously, summer doesn't slow down for Pearl. In the same week, I helped the 100 plus women who care at the Jacobs House Charity Golf Tournament, then attended a training session to become a grade level advisor for the National Charity League with one of my favorite people I've ever met through volunteering, and then spent a whirlwind day in East Los Angeles learning about mural conservation and visiting some of LA's oldest murals, just five miles from where my grandma was born in the old gray house in Green Meadows. Why does any of this matter? It shows that if I'm not running Pearl programs, I'm out there participating in our wonderful community, sharing whatever I can with other amazing charities. Pearl isn't just one person or one charity. We've been an official cultural arts center nonprofit in Murrieta for over two years. And I am grateful for the countless years of inspiration from all the nonprofit leaders who paved the way and with whom I've gotten to know as mentors and friends. As Eleanor Roosevelt once said, it is better to light a candle than curse the darkness. At Pearl, we strive to be that light, offering inspiration to illuminate the path forward for our community. This vision drives us to participate, collaborate, and engage with every part of our community. Pearl is proof that when we work together, incredible things happen. Whether at the library, the golf course, a neighbor's living room, or among the murals on the streets of Los Angeles, our mission remains the same, to build a vibrant, connected, and artistic community. Now let's talk about the Murrieta Train Project and how we can work towards opening the doors to a train car art center sooner rather than later. We clearly need this. Our community is brimming with creativity and enthusiasm, just waiting for a dedicated space to flourish. Imagine a hot new space where we can all spring into action. Let's make this happen. As Leslie Nope from Parks and Recreation wisely said, I have the most valuable commodity in America, the blind, stubborn belief that I am going to do what is right. Except I'm not blind. I see firsthand the impact we are already having and achieving, and it's beautiful. And don't worry, I won't bore you with the ever amazing and impressively important economic statistics because I already did that. Thank you, let's get this train on track and make the Murrieta train project a reality as soon as possible. Mr. Richard Elliott. Is it going to be four minutes? Okay. We're changing it. Madam Mayor, if you recall, you were for four <laughs> minutes. Uh, yes, I'm Mayor, uh, I'm Mayor Stone and Council. Uh, my name is Richard Elliott. I've been uh, living over here at uh, Monte Vista Apartments for 23 years that they opened. And there's been some incidents happening recently. Um, I believe we need more police um, in our city. Um, there are some things that are not being done when incidents happen, especially at the apartments. I've had my life threatened twice, which the police never even interviewed the person or the resident that lived in those apartments, which was the baby's daddy that threatened my life. I've had one man uh, threaten to kick my ass twice. No, did not interview that person. They interviewed me, but did not interview the other person that threatened me verbally with that. Um, I've had the mayor accuse of me having a teenage girl in my apartment, which was told to the police that that was my, my niece and my sister-in-law who were living with me, which I had written permission for them to do, and the police never talked to the mayor or the uh, manager to tell them it was not a molestation thing or anything, and it's just a lot of things with the police department. I believe they're short of staff. They're cutting, you know, what time they put in to uh, following up with very serious things that are happening. It's not just me, but it's other people also. And um, I, I requested to talk to the head person at the police department. They always just gave me a deputy on duty and nothing really has changed. Um, I've never talked to the head person and um, I understand he may be here today that we may be able to talk today possibly, but there's a lot of things going wrong over here at these apartments. I've had another homeless man that I was trying to help. He ended up leaving my apartment mad because he had a mental health diagnosis, which I have also, but mine's under control. And I am a peer support specialist <laughs> that recognizes those that have a mental health diagnosis. And he threatened to kill my life when he was leaving my apartment and the police came and they said, well, technically he didn't attempt it. He was walking out of the apartment. All these you know, things that they say, but my life 
has been threatened at least three times. And they are not following up with these people. They could not find that homeless person that I told him exactly where he was because I looked for him. And then they claim, oh, we couldn't find them. To a, and then they're not, uh, you know, you can't force someone to go to the mental health clinic, of course, if they need that help. But at least you can ask if they would like to get some help. But police aren't even doing that because I am an advocate for the mental health, uh, those with mental health diagnosis. I was homeless uh, three different times. I had a mental health diagnosis, and I have the heart to help them. And there are several things that the police are not doing. Maybe there's another agency that needs to handle that. I don't know. But we don't have enough police uh, in this area, and I'm a big advocate for the police. I used to be Neighborhood Watch in L.A., in the Filipino area there. I respect the police very much. But when my life is being threatened and they're not protecting and serve like I feel they should be doing and following up on these reports, I, I brought it to your attention that I could have had my life killed twice and uh, the police are not protecting me. Thank you very much for your time. I do appreciate your time. Have a good day. Mr. Elliott, yes. um, if you don't mind, I'm gonna have um, Captain Gomez and Mr. Ambrose speak with you out in the foyer. Okay, Is that thank okay? you very much. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Mr. Jonathan Ingram. Good evening, Council. Good evening, City Manager. I hope you all are doing well. It looks like things are consistent in the dais. Um, attending tonight to speak about uh, the item on 19, thank you for pulling that for consideration to have a workshop on it. I think that uh, I concur with my colleague, Mr. Wong, that this was one-sided and it needs to have the opportunity to be done publicly. Our council has always been very transparent, whether it's been Measure T, well, there have been other things in the past and we've afforded the opportunity for people to weigh in. I think that it's important that the taxpayers and the council are engaged in a way that they know that they have control over what happens to our taxes locally or some of it. I think it becomes essential that that happens then it's done in a public forum. And so I understand the position you're in, but affording the workshop is a good thing and it shows that we are a very transparent local government. You're doing your job. So I just want to take the opportunity to thank you. I appreciate it. Have a nice evening, guys. And by the way, the, the, when you pull that, I was all dressed to come to the dance, and I have no date. So <laughs> I had everything prepared on what I was going to say. So God bless you. That concludes public comments, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Madam City Clerk. Moving on to the consent calendar. This is approval of items 1 through 16. The items on the consent calendar are considered routine and may be enacted in one motion and vote. There will be no discussion of these items unless specific items are removed from the consent calendar for a separate motion. Are there any other requests from the City Council to pull a consent calendar item for discussion or abstain from voting? Seeing none. Madam City Clerk, are there any members of the public requesting to speak on a consent calendar item? Seeing none. Um, I see we have a motion from Council Member Lavelle, a second by MPT Warren, and please vote. Motion carries unanimously, 4-0. Thank you, Madam City Clerk. Moving on to public hearing. Item number 17 is the adoption of the fiscal year 2024-2025 operating budget for the Marietta Fire District. And thank you, and you may proceed. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and members of City Council. My name is Jennifer Terry, and I'm the finance manager here at the city. Uh, the objective of this item is to conduct a public hearing for the adoption of the fiscal year 25 final operating budget for the Marietta Fire District. 
The city adopts a two year or biannual budget every odd numbered year. The city council approved the fiscal year 23-24 and 24-25 operating budgets on June 6, 2023. Mm -hmm. However, the Marietta Fire District was formed under and must comply with California health and safety codes, specifically health and safety code sections 13890, 13893, and 13895. Health and Safety Code Section 13890 requires adoption of a preliminary budget, which was satisfied at the June 4th Council meeting. Health and Safety Code 16893 requires a publication of a notice of public hearing in general circulation in a gen newspaper of general circulation. That notice was published on June 3rd and scheduled tonight as the public hearing. Finally, Health and Safety Code 13895 requires holding a public hearing to consider the adoption of the final district budget. The final fiscal year 2425 Marietta Fire District budget totals $24,750,080. The revenues are balanced with expenditure, the, rev the revenue are, the, the revenues are balanced with expenditures with an operating transfer uh, from Measure T of approximately $7.4 million. Uh, and there have been no changes to this budget since the ad adopted budget in June of 23. Uh, staff, uh, the actions tonight are to conduct, conduct the public hearing, adopt the proposed resolution approving the fiscal year 24-25 final operating budget for the Marietta Fire District. This concludes uh, my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, we will take council member questions for staff. And seeing none, we will go ahead and open up the public hearing. Madam City Clerk, are there any public testimony regarding this item? Seeing none. Okay, I'll close the hearing. Um, we'll bring it back to the dais for City Council discussion. Do we have a discussion? Seeing none, call for a motion and a second. I see we have a motion from Council Member Holliday, a second from MPT Warren. Please vote. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Madam Board City zero. Clerk. You're welcome. We'll move on to item 18, discussion, Marietta Library expansion, design, and budget. Assistant City Manager Crane, could you please introduce the item? Yes, thank you. We'll just wait for our team to come. So uh, item 18 tonight marks a really important milestone for the library expansion project. We are at a critical juncture for this uh, process where we are ready to move to the next phase which is developing a detailed design uh, for the expansion area that will then be used to go out to bid to hire the construction contractor. So as um, part of the presentation this evening, staff is going to be updating you on the progress to date and explaining the recommended next steps for your consideration. And as you're going to hear, um, before we can move to the next steps, we're at this point where we not only need to confirm the project design, but we also need to confirm the project budget and our funding strategy for how we're going to complete the construction and pay for the library expansion. Getting to this exciting point has been a collaborative effort with participation from several departments and you're going to hear from them this evening, project manager Brian Crawford, finance director Javier Carcamo, and community services director Brian Ambrose. And I really wanna thank the whole team, also including Melvin Rosellis and the other library team members. There has been a lot of work happening behind the scenes to get the project to this point in terms of narrowing in on what that recommended strategy is going to be developing a really robust, complete and detailed budget so that we understand fully what the cost is going to be as we're uh, making that financial commitment and also really thinking through a detailed timeline on exactly what's gonna be necessary so that we can take advantage of the grant, which does have a clock ticking by which we need to spend that money. So there's a lot of information that we're gonna cover with you tonight and we appreciate your patience as we go into that and explain all the different pieces of the puzzle um, and our recommendation. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Brian Crawford. 
Thank you, Kristen. I really appreciate that introduction. Um, first of all, I wanted to go through the history of the library. Um, the library was built in 2007. It's got a 2,700 square foot children's section. Comparatively, the adult section uh, is roughly 10,000 square feet. So you can see the comparison and the imbalance there. Um, there's always the intent to go back and do a phase two um, and to expand into the Garden of Versus area. And that was hampered, you know, there was some economic downturn of 2008, plus we needed to wait until we had a point in time where we had the funding from Library Diff to proceed. So luckily, um, and really thanks to Melvin Rosellis and his team over at the library, uh, they put in for a grant uh, with the California State Library, their Building Forward grant. And the city was awarded $1.5 million in grant funds. And we had to match with 750,000 for a total of $2.25 million. But one of the primary reasons that we're here today and discussing any kind of an expansion is due to, due to Melvin and his team. We wanted to make sure that um, we kept the project goals in mind when we were going into this. So as Kristen had mentioned, there is a sunset date with that we need to have everything spent with the grant fund. So that's March of 2026. So while that seems uh, like two years away, it is gonna come pretty quick. Uh, so we needed to make sure that we kept all of that in mind. Um, one of the things that we also were thinking about is that we wanted to make sure that we maximize the building footprint as much as we possibly can, because we realize this is probably going to be the last major expansion of this facility. So we want to make sure that we have um, the space for the amount of programming that we're going to be able to deliver to the residents of Murrieta and their children for the next several decades. So it's a really important um, project for that. We also want to make sure that we are good financial stewards. Um, we're spending taxpayer dollars, we're spending grant funds, we want to make sure that we're making the right decisions, making the right recommendations, and making sure that also our budget is realistic and it's closely monitored and that we are building something that is within our means and that we're living within our means. We also need to make sure that while we have this project and it's a really important project, um, we also have other capital projects in the city. So we need to make sure that it was balanced with the needs of other capital projects. Just wanted to briefly recap our progress so far. Um, I was here in March of 2024, and you've seen a lot of this information. Um, we, um, we entered a design uh, architectural services agreement with SDA Architects in June of 2023. At that time, we really didn't know what our budget was for the project. We went into the RFP process for architectural services with a roughly $2.25 million budget. Of course, that wasn't going to be the, uh, the final amount, and so we negotiated a contract with SVA Architects that when we have an understanding of when our, what our budget is going to be, of course, that amount will increase, and it's based upon a sliding scale a percentage, and we'll discuss that a little bit later. Um, starting in July and ending in August of 2023, we held a series of workshops over at the library with a, a, a large number of community stakeholders. We had friends of the library, Myriad Library Foundation, homeschoolers, um, we had library staff, city staff, and what we asked at that, at that workshop, what SVA asked was, what do you want, what do you need? And SVA conducted a needs assessment, and they also conducted a space analysis. And so they came back with a series of, of designs, different iterations, bubble diagrams, and kind of put together a really nice footprint for us and um, ending with those workshops, we came in at around a 6,500 square foot uh, building expansion. Uh, we realized later that probably wasn't gonna fit into our budget. So we refined, we refined the uh, preliminary design and the budget over the next couple months after that um, with the assistance of the city manager's office. And um, we arrived at something along the lines of 5,000 square feet and six to $6.5 million. So, as you recall, in January of this year, you um, attended a council goals workshop and you uh, noted that this project was a priority and you gave a consensus agreement that yes, it's a priority, yes, we should do it, 
and the budget should be six to six point five million dollars. So after that, we went back to SVA and said, let's go ahead and proceed with schematic design and our official cost estimate. So they did that and uh, their cost estimate came in way higher. So all the estimates that we had been dealing with before that were really rough estimates and they were, they were not based upon exact details of the schematic design and how we were gonna build that facility. So it came in a little bit higher and we'll discuss that in just a second as well. So in the past, since April, we've had SVA working on a, on a variety of value engineering designs. Uh, so that really is a fancy way of just saying, what can we reduce while still keeping the core elements of the building footprint intact, what can we reduce in order to um, get the cost in line with what the council agreed to. So that's what they've been doing for the past couple months and that's what we're gonna be showing you tonight. So option A is the 5,000 square foot. Um, we've got a price tag of 8.44 million to 9.86 million. This is the design that I think a lot of you have seen. This is the one that we um, showed you in March of 2024. Um, the primary reason we're doing the expansion is for uh, the story time rooms and to expand programming. And that's held largely in the multi-purpose room, NPR one and two on plan side north there. Uh, then we have the children's stacks and we have workstations for our library staff so they can work on programming needs. It's also a security element that they can keep an eye on the expansion space um, with all the children in that space. On Plan Side South, we have uh, the maker space. Um, so that was gonna be an innovative, creative space uh, that uh, would kind of be like a lab for children. So we can do a lot of uh, really cool, interesting 3D printing and projects. And then we also had a family restroom um, down uh, on Plan Side South as well. And on all of these options, um, we still have the existing space uh, for the children's library. We're gonna have to reimagine it so we have a cohesive design going from the existing space into the new space. But in each of the iterations that we're gonna show you, we still have NPR rooms, we still have children's stacks, and we still have staff workspace and the existing library. So I think you've also seen this um, elevation where we have the really cool butterfly roof and a lot of glazing windows um, on this design. And this was looking into the north uh, garden area. And then I believe you've also seen this exterior design. This was based upon that 5,000 square foot footprint. Um, this is the full Cadillac version of the exterior space design. Um, it's got a lot of reading nooks and it's got raised garden beds for um, programming for children's gardening uh, programming. Uh, we also have a small little amphitheater for um, story time room or story time uh, space, and then a lot of hardscape and trails, and most importantly, in our climate, uh, shading. So we had a ton of trees out here, which is gonna be really amazing. So we'll, we'll talk about this full design as well when we talk about uh, some of the estimates. So um, just a note about the estimate that I had on the first slide for this option. Um, it started off at 8.44 uh, million, the 9.86 is with the Cadillac version. The 8.44 is with a minimally designed exterior. So what that means really is we would have fencing, we would have um, some softscape, we have had a little bit of hardscape, but we wouldn't have um, the fully designed exterior that would give us um, really the additional programming space because we see the exterior as important programming space as well the continuation of that programming space from the interior to the exterior. Option B, um, this is at 4,500 square feet at 7.05 million, and it is the recommended option. You'll see it's a little bit different than option A. Um, the biggest difference that you see is the NPR rooms have been moved down to plan side south, and that's for efficiency purposes. And you'll also notice that the entire expansion follows the diagonal um, uh, layout of the original space. And one of the reasons that it can do this is because you'll see at the, um, at the top of this diagram, you'll see a fault line set back in red. So that's a fault line. It's an actual fault line that we cannot build on. So that would be, uh, that's 
safe for exterior spaces and hardscape and ex stuff like that, but not for building footprints. So since we moved the NPR rooms, we're not having to deal with that fault line setback so we can make it diagonal and um, utilize that space fully and kind of have a little bit of continuity from the existing space to the new space. We also leave um, most of the staff space intact. It's reduced slightly. Um, and then this is a more, also a more efficient design uh, and layout because one of the large elements that we reduced from the original design is the butterfly roof. So mm -hmm. this is structurally easier to build and it's got more of a traditional flat line roof line. However, I don't want anybody to be disappointed in that is because our architects have assured us that we can do something architecturally in interesting on the interior ceiling. ceiling. It doesn't need to be just a drop down ceiling. It could be something pretty interesting like this that we have in our chambers here. So um, they've shown us some really interesting uh, ways of getting around that and making it architecturally in interesting from the inside. And I'm really excited to see that. Um, but you'll see that in this design, we still have intact the stacks, the NPR, and the staff space. They've also come up with new elevations for us. You can see that this is the elevation looking from the north. Um, you'll see that we still have some trees out there and uh, for shading. Um, it's just not gonna be, when we, when, when we do a minimal exterior, it's not gonna be as many trees and it's not gonna have like the hardscape that we're looking for. And in this design, it's this price tag that I've shown you is with a minimally, minimally uh, designed exterior. And we have another elevation here showing you from a different angle. And it really, sh it really follows the architectural elements from the main building. So it, that's carried through into this area. So we're gonna have a mixture of stucco with exterior plus metal and uh, wood elements on there as well. So one of the things we needed to ask SVA was, look, we've gone to council already. We've, they've approved a six to $6.5 million budget. What can we do to get it into that line? So we asked them to whittle away a little bit more and come up with a space that's roughly 4,200 to 4,300 square feet and is in the range that you've asked for. And this one is, we'll call it option C. You'll see that we still have eliminated the maker space. Um, we have the children's stacks, that area has been reduced. The workstation area has been reduced. Um, so it's just a small amount of reduction, um, but this, uh, you know, if, if we were to proceed with option C by any chance, we would still probably move around those NPRs to make a more cohesive footprint. So I think it's also important to understand that when we talk about these numbers, um, you know, for option B, it's $7.05 million. That's not just the amount that we're gonna get on bid day when we go and uh, release our construction documents for bidding. So, that includes a lot of soft costs. So we have hard costs versus soft costs. So it's important to also note that all the numbers that we're talking about, A, are estimates. They can change at any point in time. And B, um, they are, they are uh, amounts that we're anticipating on bid day next year. So there's an escalator built into the construction costs that we anticipate getting on bid day. So. Um, it's, got an annual, it's got an annual escalator of 8% built in. So for option B's budget, we're just looking at over $4.4 .4 million in hard, hard costs for construction. And then we also always add a construction contingency when we come back and award the contract next year and we ask council for those additional funds, um, we'll be asking for a 15% construction contingency. We also have design costs. So, like I mentioned before, with SVA, we have a contract with them, and we have certain bands if we stay, say for example, in between four and uh, $5 million, it's roughly 11%. If we go uh, above $5 million in construction costs, um, it's going to reduce down to 10.5%. So it's also important to note that when we go to bid, we're gonna have, um, we don't know what those bids are gonna come back. We are hopefully gonna, our, our ideal is that we have gone through um, our 
construction documents and our bid documents and through the entire process of, of, of uh, compiling those documents that we've gone through cost estimations and we have really great information and we can at least get pretty close to what it's going to be. Um, but um, we are also going to probably add some add alternatives to those bid items. So when we talk about the exterior space, it's, uh, we're not just going to put out minimal for the exterior on the bid. We're going to probably add in a couple of layers on top of that that if we choose to bid to uh, build those, we'll at least have the pricing for it and we can add them on as layers. So we're not having to rip out um, exterior to add on things later. So those are things potentially, depending on how those bids come back, if they come back favorably and we do have the funding to be able to build those, those are things that we would consider at that point in time. So if we do those adults or our construction costs are coming in above what we're anticipating on this, then our, um, our uh, design costs, at least the percentage would go down. So at the end of the day, we'll true up with them. We also have project and construction management costs, and it's roughly 10%, $465,000. Um, we're going to talk about the partnership that we have with RW Bid in just a moment. Um, we also will have fixtures, furnishings, and equipment, and plus technology. Um, we're talking about computers, IT technology, swipe uh, uh, points at doors, and cameras, and, um, and uh, Wi-Fi connections, that kind of thing. So $560,000 for, 560, for that. And then, of course, the existing space remodel, 250000 and then permitting and inspection fees. So we have roughly $7.05 million. Um, the project funding, it's going to come from a variety of sources. We, of course, have the grant and the matching funds that we had, and we're also uh, proposing to use uh, library DIF, developer impact fees, and an interfund loan, and then private fundraising donations. And we'll talk about that in just a moment as well. I don't want to steal uh, Javier's uh, thunder here, so I'm going to turn it over to him, and he's going to talk about all the really cool financial things that we need to get through. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Brian. Uh, good evening, Honorable Mayor, Council Members. So for the next few slides, I'm going to briefly talk about the funding strategy that we have put together for this project. And I'll start off with a um, little background on the, the project itself. So the Children's Library expansion has been part of the uh, DIF study in prior years, prior studies. And therefore, we have been collecting uh, DIF uh, over the years, which uh, Brian shared with you earlier, that we have uh, DIF allocated as part of our matching component for the grant. Um, Therefore, the uh, library DIF fund and the revenue sources that we collect are acceptable funding sources to support this project. Generally, uh, when a project uh, as such uh, is being proposed, uh, we normally wait until 100% of funding is available out of the development impact fee funds in order for the project to become, uh, a, uh, become realized. Uh, based on the um, projected revenue of approximately $100,000, $130,000 a year, uh, assuming we didn't have outside you know, financing resources available, and this is the only resource that we have, and considering the, the, the cost of construction um, over the years, it probably takes about 10 years for us to have enough funding in that fund, uh, unless we can come up with a, uh, financial resources that are outside the city, which we do. So as uh, Brian shared, we have several funding sources. We have a grant, um, and graciously by our uh, library staff doing great work in finding those grants and applying for those grants. Uh, we have development impact fees uh, that we're utilizing um, out of the library there, and that's about $752,000. Uh, we also have an additional library DIF uh, funds that we are allocating towards the project. Uh, that's another $752,000. As um, Brian shared, we staff is seeking uh, sponsorship, private donations as well, and that's approximately $550,000. Mr. Brian Ambrose uh, will uh, briefly talk about those efforts. 
Um, and based on the, for instance, project option B estimated cost of 7051000 uh, what's still unfunded and remaining is approximately $3.5 million. And so over the prior months, we have looked at uh, options on how to fund the $3.5 million. Um, have in, we have engaged, finance department have engaged our financial advisor um, to help us forecast what the uh, options that we have. And so we're looking at two options. We have, considering the outside financing resources, uh, we have option uh, to issue a bond. And normally that uh, will require uh, some costs associated with issuing the bonds. Uh, cost of issuance, for instance, and underwriter fees. There are advantages and disadvantages of issuing a bond. Uh, so advantages is that it does not impact the uh, cash flow for the city um, on, on a temporary basis until that service comes on board. Um, uh, however, disadvantages that we have associated with issuing a bond is that capacity, uh, so it would fully considering 100% of the defund towards uh, the debt service payment that will take full capacity out of that fund uh, for any future uh, uh, bond issuance. Um, and of course, there are some uh, bond covenants that we have to follow as part of issuing a bond. Uh, if we do issue a bond, uh, the repayment source for that will be the library def revenue sources. Uh, so considering um, that you know, the bond market that we have today, uh, that target interest rate for a public bond offering uh, for this type of bond will be approximately 4.63% uh, interest. Um, certainly that changes on, almost on a daily basis, but at the time of the analysis, it's 4.63%. Um, so based on those conditions, bond, uh, bond issuance at this point and the market conditions require a higher interest rate and therefore we uh, expect a higher uh, interest expense and debt service payment. Um, the projected uh, debt service payment based on a 30 year bond is $218,000. That is indeed currently greater than the ongoing diff revenue source uh, that we expect on an annual basis, which is approximately $130,000. The other option uh, that we looked at is a, a internal interfund loan, and there are some advantages with that, and that is it, it's cost-effective borrowing. Um, it, it's a lower cost. There is no cost of issuance. There is no um, underwriter fees, um, and there's certainly no covenants that we have to follow. Uh, however, it does impact cash flow, or it does impact our reserves. Uh, the, the loan, if we do an internal uh, service internal, internal interfund loan, excuse me, um, we are considering to use our reserve sustainability reserve primarily um, uh, to utilize towards the, the, the loan. Uh, base, considering the, uh, that the proposed loan terms will benefit both the borrowing funds and, and also the bonds that is lending the funds. Uh, therefore, uh, at the rate that we're proposing, uh, it should equate to approximately what the uh, city's uh, investment return, rate of return is um, on a long-term basis. We're uh, co uh, considering a 1% uh, interest uh, on a 30-year, kind of the same as the bond uh, term. That equates to approximately um, average 136,515 um, this is slightly greater than our uh, ongoing revenue sources for the DIF. However, uh, we plan to uh, propose a adjusted debt service payment that is uh, proposing a payment of 130000 for the first 29 years um, with a, um, one final payment of about 325000 uh, So average that equates uh, to $136,000 a year. Based on the analysis that we work with our financial advisor, we are um, recommending, given the opportunity costs associated between um, 
uh, issuing a debt associated with the bond versus uh, uh, utilizing our internal funds and, and, and the interest earnings on those internal funds, we found a benefit uh, that an internal loan will, will, will provide to the city, uh, primarily on interest expense. Uh, the, as I shared with you, and a recap of the uh, financing resources, we have the opportunity today to really take advantage of those uh, external financial resources. We'll bring this uh, project to fruition sooner than later um, by utilizing the grant and the donations. Uh, we have earmarked financial resources, which is the library DIF, as, um, and we're gonna utilize both the, the DIF fund balance um, to, uh, uh, to utilize it as the match component and some additional uh, DIF to lower the, the loan. And also it will serve as the debt service payment um, uh, source. Um, and again, the, we uh, project that the internal uh, fund is the most cost-effective borrowing and the most advantageous at this point in time. Tonight, really, we're not um, uh, 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 bringing any formal internal fund loan agreement for approval. We're just seeking your uh, um, confirmation whether or not your, uh, this funding strategy is of your favor. Um, and if so, then uh, we plan to bring that loan agreement at some point in the future, likely when we get closer to the construction or, or awarding the construction um, agreement. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Brian, who's going to speak with, to you or share with you about the fundraising uh, efforts. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of the City Council. I think you can hear uh, just how hard we've been working on this project for a little bit over the year. Um, special thanks to uh, Melvin uh, Rosellas at the, uh, my left here, uh, library manager and library staff in the front row. Um, while I wish we were in an environment where construction costs remained normal, uh, we've been battling year after year construction cost increase of double digits, and that's impacted kind of the bottom line of this project. What this means in practice is that in order to construct the expansion necessary for the future of the Murrieta community, an expansion, an expansion that takes into consideration fiscal responsibilities balanced with the needs of the children's library as determined through stakeholder input, the city will have to look for outside assistance. However, this was always considered to be part of the strategy and is in fact the very reason for the existence of the Friends of the Murrieta, uh, the Friends of the Murrieta Library and the Murrieta Library Foundation. The Murrieta Library Foundation was started in 2008 to raise funds for capital improvement projects, specifically phase two of the library. Therefore, staff is proposing to the city council to approve uh, the recommended plan that relies on a fundraising goal of $550,000. While this goal may seem substantial, these two organizations have already discussed commitment levels that get us about a third of the way there. Additionally, staff is planning on other fundraising strategies. Mr. Crawford and myself are working with a family here in Murrieta that have previously donated substantial amounts to the library in the past. Mr. Rosellis and myself have begun meeting weekly with an ad hoc committee of the Murrieta Library Foundation on a series of fundraising ideas, such as name plaques on book stacks. Next, we'll develop a list of other potential high donor sponsors in collaboration with the foundation and the friends. The Library Foundation has already started a mailer campaign and donations are starting to come in. And of course, we're hoping there's four individuals in front of me, five in total, that uh, would be excited about helping us reach our project goals and our fundraising goals in the future. Now to two quick points before I turn the presentation back to Mr. Crawford. If this city council approves staff's recommendation this evening, it supports our fundraising efforts. We recognize there's a certain amount of trust involved in taking this action. Fortunately, we have until February of 2025 for these funds to be committed. At that time, we'll be working on the agenda report to award the construction contract for the project, and we'll come back to the City Council to provide the update of if, how much we've raised at that point. But second, and this is important, 
Everyone at this table is optimistic that the Marietta community will go over and above to support this library project. We are gonna draft the bid documents in such a way that it'll include those adult bid items that Mr. Crawford mentioned. Meaning if we collect over our fundraising goals, excess <laughs> funds will be used towards the construction of a fully designed exterior space. This includes spaces that can be used for programming, for children and families to be able to hear story time outside, and for grown-ups to have spaces and nooks available that will be quiet and peaceful during daytime hours. In conclusion, the staff that is joining me at this table have worked tirelessly on this proposal. We recognize the fiscal challenges of proposing an expansion of this size, but this expansion will be busy by day one. As soon as we open the doors, it will be filled. So with that, I will turn the presentation back to Mr. Crawford to discuss the next steps and timelines. Thank you so much. Uh, so tonight we're asking for your direction and your confirmation of what we're proposing. And then uh, you'll see on this, I've got from July, to July of 2024 to February of 2025, I've got one line there. Um, in reality, that's gonna be a really, really, really busy time. So immediately what we're gonna do is we're, um, hopefully with your agreement, is we're gonna engage with a uh, project management and construction management consultant, RW Bid. Um, that, that partner, along with SVA, is gonna get us to the finish line of being able to go out to bid. So during these next couple of months, the reason we're gonna have all our organization plus those two organizations working together is making sure that we have constructability reviews through the design process, making sure that we have um, checks and balances on the cost estimates so we have a complete understanding or as good an understanding as we possibly can get on what we anticipate on bid day. So, and then also making sure that we have really tight bid documents and we don't have errors and omissions that would potentially drive change orders during the construction process. This is super important. So these next couple eight months are gonna be pretty busy. Um, then we'll finally, uh, in February, our plan is once we have those bid documents together, we're gonna come back to you, we're gonna show you the final design and the bid documents and make sure that we have an understanding, again, of what the financing mechanisms are gonna be before we take this out to bid. Um, then we'll go through the construction bid process and then we'll come back to the city council for award of the construction contract. And hopefully it's gonna be within the uh, budget that we have set and everybody's happy and then we can proceed with the construction. Um, we're hoping to start that in July of 2025. And then, as we've said before, we need to make sure that those grant funds are expended by March of 2026. We're gonna make sure that we front load everything during the construction. Those grant funds are gonna be used and they can really only be used. They can't be used for anything exterior. They can't be used for um, the design of the exterior. So. Uh, it has to be used for the building footprint. So we're gonna make sure that obviously that's part of the, that's one of the first things that's gonna be built. So it's front loaded and we make sure that we expend those grant funds on those, um, on those items. And then hopefully we'll, a year later, we'll complete construction and we'll open that um, really great expansion for the Murrieta community. Um, but I think everybody at this table and everybody that we've been working with, that I've been working with at the library, I do wanna mention uh, Katie Mathewson and Ashley Bagai and Casey Thompson and in engineering has been part of our team and making sure that we uh, take the appropriate action and we have everything set for this. This is a really exciting project and we're really looking forward to it. So what we're asking you tonight is the approve uh, moving forward to the next phase of the project design for design option B. Approve recommended project financing strategy, including use of interfund, interfund loan. Like Javier mentioned, we're gonna come back to you with a, an appropriate agreement for that interfund loan um, the closer we get to uh, going out to bid. Um, we're, gonna off, uh, we're gonna ask you to authorize a change order for SVA architects. Like I mentioned before, we have a sliding scale agreement with them. This, this budget that we're gonna set sets that um, that sliding scale agreement, the construction costs higher. So it's a change order that uh, is necessary at this time. We're gonna ask you to approve a purchase order with RW Bid Construction Management. 
and then authorize $500,000 of the fiscal year 2024-25 CIP project budget for this project to be eligible for use effective immediately so we can issue those POs and start bowling, ball rolling on our partnership with SVA and RW bid July 1st and get to the finish line. And with that, we're available for questions. Can you comments. go back to that slide? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. So you are recommending that uh, we approve option B? Yes, ma'am. Can you bring that back up, please? Yes. The diagram, thank you. Um, I have a question for you, Brian. Is the lab not in this design? So the lab has been removed from this design. Yeah. Option A had the lab. I know that there's been some concern with not having a, yeah. a lab space. We have, uh, we've come up with some pretty novel approach to solve that, mm -hmm. okay? So it doesn't necessarily mean we have to build additional space. Mm -hmm. We have a, uh, a space that's been used formerly as a computer lab. Right now, it's not really being used for anything except for a meeting room. Okay. So you can, I think you may know that without this expansion, the children's programming, a large part of it is done in the existing multi-purpose room. Mm -hmm. That multi-purpose room is a, basically a community room. Mm -hmm. It's used by adults um, and children alike for all sorts of programming. We use it for internal and external meetings. Um, and so that lab space right now is sort of being used for a meeting space. Mm -hmm. So what we had thought was, since we're moving all of the children's programming into the new expansion, um, that existing multi-purpose room goes back to the adults and we could potentially turn, turn that uh, X computer lab into a maker space. And I think it's important to note that maker spaces aren't just for kids, they can also be right. used for adults. So it's positioned in a way that it's really accessible to the children's space and the adult space. Um, it's got great visibility. It's a, basically, it's been described as a fishbowl. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're having a meetings in there, it's kind of weird. Uh, but I think it would be a really great, perfect space for that. And I know um, that uh, it, ideally we would have had that maker space, but that costs a lot of money. Right. And uh, what we're trying to do is bring it back within budget. Um, I love the out, out of the box thinking that you have provided us. Um, I'd like to get consensus from my colleagues that I, I think the lab is very, very important. Yes. I agree. Thank you. We have consensus that we would like for you to facilitate a lab within the space. Absolutely. Okay, fantastic. All right, so I'm going to uh, bring this back for questions from our colleagues. Nope. I'm not going to do that. Yes, I'm going to do that. Uh, Council Member Holliday. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, everyone, for all the hard work that went into this. I know this has been a heavy lift to get it to this point, even though we still have a long way to go. Um, could you go to option C, design, for a second? Why is this one tilted when option B was not? So option B, uh, what I mentioned was that since we moved the NPR 1 and 2 down to plan side south, we don't have to deal with that fault line setback. So you'll notice that option A was along the same line. We, mm -hmm. we, it was kind of coming straight out of uh, the existing space. Um, but since we're not having to deal with that fault line, in option B, we're able to tilt the building back this way. It kind of takes it, it, it makes it easier to construct. And, SBA, right. that's what SBA tells me, at least. No, I, I agree. I just don't know why when they went to option C, why then they leave the NPR rooms on the other side and keep it straight? Um, it's something that if we did go with option C, we would probably move the NPR 1 and 2 down to plan side south and make it more of a cohesive. I really was looking for them to um, make the space reductions and illustrate the space reductions on this. And where we see the workstations have been reduced, children's stacks been reduced. Um, it wasn't to kind of re recreate everything. Exactly, yeah, that's what I thought too, but I've dealt with architects many times and sometimes they get funny ideas. Let's move this over here, mm -hmm. see how it looks. Yep. Um, and you said that the design percentage drops at five million to 10 and a half percent? Yes, it does. For the entire cost or is that tiered? So it's for the entire construction costs. 
So if we have add alts or we have um, change orders, anything that's gonna push us above that five million, at the end of the day, we're gonna have a true up with SVA. Mm -hmm. So we're going to, you know, we're gonna make sure that whatever our construction costs fall in, that's the band that we're paying at and, and the rate that we're paying at. Because if it's, if it's not tiered, that means that if we go $1 over, they're gonna actually get a cut in pay. Yes. Okay, just verifying that. That's silly on their part, but good for us. Great negotiating skills I have, I think. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you all the credit. Yeah, for that. I'll, I'll agree. <laughs> um, and then um, Javier, the next ones are for you. Shocking, I know. <laughs> the interfund loan versus the bond. Um, when do we have to make that decision? Uh, today? I, I, today, I, I would prefer if you <laughs> provide us with some guidance, uh, it will be helpful for us. I mean, I think primarily for staff too, knowing that we're going with option B with the $7 million and we have a plan on how to fund that. If, if I could add to that too, sorry, from over here. The piece is if we were to opt to go with a bond, there's a process and a timeline involved in that, a ramp up time. And so that's why it's really important to understand from you if you're comfortable with the financing strategy using the internal loan, because if you're not, then we would go down a different path and start the work on the bond process. Though as Javier pointed out, there's some challenges with that. So it's important that we know that from you now as opposed to when we're getting ready to award the construction contract and we haven't secured the bond. No, I understand. In a difficult I'm, position. I'm very well versed on bond issuances and the challenges leading up to them and the time that it takes. Um, of course, as Javier knows, you know, the experts, quotes, thought the Fed was going to reduce interest rates uh, some like six times this year. And we're halfway through the year. And how many times have they dropped them so far? Zero. None. Zero. <laughs> so, yeah, I wouldn't count on interest rates coming down anytime soon to where it would make the bond more attractive. Um, and you had mentioned on the interfund loan that is coming out of sustainability reserves? Correct. So, the looking at our reserves, we have set aside some reserves primarily for our pension. As you know, pension is a long-term um, uh, obligation and therefore it's a long-term solution. Um, so while we have some funds there, um, we feel that it's a good source to utilize for internal service loan, internal interfund loan, um, given that um, it, it, it definitely will provide the most benef benefit to the, to the city at this point. And the um, total amount in that fund currently? Um, and the, I believe it's $6 million. $6 million, so we're borrowing a little over half of that then. Correct. Okay, and the 1% interest rate, um, what are we currently earning on that? those investments today? Well, given the high interest rate, we're actually earning very good right now. However, when we're looking at this in long-term basis, in a 30-year, for instance, our yield has been, for our portfolio, has been around 1%. I understand, but what is it today? Um, uh, so our, we have two different investment options right now. So our portfolio right now, it's, it's yielding somewhere around two, I don't have the number in front of me, but I would say somewhere around two and 3%. Between two and three on that particular fund? Um, on, on our long-term investment portfolio. However, we also have our short-term investments uh, with our, our financial institution, and we're earning very close to 5%. But we're not looking at borrowing those funds. Correct. We're looking at borrowing the long-term funds. Correct. And so while in the short term, there might be an interest deficit over the long term, it's going to be similar to what our average investment has been for 30 years. Correct. Okay. That's all the questions I have. Thank you, Council Member Holliday, MPT Warren. Thank you, Mayor. Um, excellent presentation. Your, your heart is in this 100% and it's very obvious. Um, and this community has asked for this, which is, which is what you're trying to give them. Um, ask and answered questions. Thank you, uh, Council Member Holliday, for taking care of the reserve questions I had. Appreciate that. I have two questions. Could you go back to this uh, slide, uh, option B, the layout? <laughs> Yes. I noticed here that 
the, the children's rooms would be one and two down below. Um, you would be using some of that. Is the offices where they're located, how would there be eyes on kids if the rooms are so far away from where the office is? So before, let me go back to option A and I'll show okay. you originally where they were. Um, so when you have workstations right next to the NPR, you really don't have direct line of sight, okay. even at that uh, point. With option B, um, we do have a little bit more, we have more line of sight going all the way through the stacks over to the NPR rooms. Okay. And plus part of the technology package that we have are cameras. Okay, cool. I just wanted to ask about that because that is a concern. You know, yes, I want to make sure we do have eyes on our little ones all the time. And also, um, the lab, I feel, is extremely important, as my colleagues do. How much more will it cost to outfit the lab with the technology that's going to be needed and using a space that's already there that you had mentioned? So are we looking at it, a lot of money, or is that kind of figured in there as well? You know, I'm going to turn that probably over to Melvin, because he might have more of an idea of what the cost of that would be. Yeah, it would really depend on the type of equipment that we would put in there. So okay. typically 3D printers, sometimes laser cutters, depending on if it is for children or for adults. So we'd be looking more towards children equipment. So it really depends on what we decide to put in there. So it would be a flexible space depending on the needs of the community at that current time. So I couldn't really give you a, a ballpark estimate. We'd really have to assess the room and see what we really want to put in it. And of course, it wouldn't be permanent, so we could always add and adjust later as, as we see fit. Okay, thank you, that concludes my questions. Thank you, Mayor. Um, before we go to public comments, I just have two more questions for you. Um, since we're, we're not gonna do the butterfly um, roofing, is there a chance that we could, in the future, if we need more space, do a second story? <clears throat> I'm going to have to say no to that, okay. <laughs> to that one. Uh, so uh, doing a two-story presents a bunch of challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's how you've engineered the first story. Right. And then it's also ingress and egress from two separate locations along with an elevator. Yes. Um, so it, it, I'm going to, I would probably say no. Okay. It, it would not happen. Thank you. I asked that question with regards to our police department a couple of meetings ago. Um, last question is, would we be penalized if we were to pay that bond off sooner than 30 years? The bond option, um, there, there may not be a prepayment penalty, it all depends on how we, we uh, establish the bond. So there might be the option for a no prepayment penalty if we decide to pay that off sooner than later. Okay, thank you, Javier. Okay, uh, we're gonna move on to public comments. Madam City Clerk, are there any public comments regarding this item? We have Rita Nastri. Stone, City Council members, and Kim, hi. Um, my name is Rita Nastri, and as president of the Friends of the Murrieta Library, some of whom are back here tonight, um, I'd like to say how proud we are of the Friends, how proud the Friends are, rather, to have helped the city of Murrieta establish our public library within its own realm in 1995, 1999, sorry. Um, it was established in a bank at first. Um, not being part of the Riverside County Library System has really set us all aside as the city and the, and the library itself. The city has become progressive and the library is even more progressive and successful. I mean, this is a major library here. Over these past years, the library has become a focal point for Murrieta families and neighbors who look forward to not only the books that the library provides, but also the many programs, not only for children, but I have to tell you, there's lots of adults who love this place. Just as an example, at the end of our second week of this, this year's summer reading program, the library has already committed over 18 community members, which is really interesting. They've signed up last year and the year before, over 2,000 had signed up. Um, both years, 70% of the participants were children ages zero to 12. 
Currently, we've been bringing in 120 to 170 people for our summer story times in the garden. And as we go into the fall, this, will, of course, will decrease because of the allowable space. Our library has also embraced the Library for All program, as well as provided sheltered workshops for those involved. The library's reputation of excellence, ingenuity, and progressive programming shows that it's ready to take on new adventures and growth. Our friends opened the first bookstore to support the library and continued to assist in obtaining a state bond grant, which made possible the opening of our first library on March 17th in 2007, as it was said. At this time, the friends opened their second bookstore. With the growth of affordable housing in our region has come a concurrent increase in young families with children in Murrieta. This brings the need to provide library services for families and their children. I'm gonna move forward fast. I have to brag here a minute. I'm sure most of the council members don't know that these volunteers have raised over $1.3 million in 25 cent books and dollar books. And we will continue to do this to support our library through our two bookstores. But as the president, I am proud to say that the board of directors of the Friends of the Murrieta Library has voted to provide $100,000 for the new children's room expansion, which will go specifically towards furnishings for the interior of the expansion. Do not disappoint these hardworking volunteers. We urge you to approve the $7 million project for the expansion, which will support the growth and development of Murrieta's yeah, youngest residents, thank you all. Thank you. you know, we just want to give you a... Yeah. I have um, Commissioner Meeker. Good evening, Mayor and members of City Council. My name is Jeff Meeker, and as you might know, I have the privilege of being one of your library advisory um, commission members. My fellow commissioners and I have been watching the library expansion project mature into what it is today. And at least speaking for myself, I'm very excited to witness the next step in this amazing journey. Library manager Rosellis and his team have done an excellent job of identifying our library's needs and then translating that into a workable plan to expand the library to better serve our growing community. Uh, really, um, I just wanted to say thank you for supporting the library on this journey. Sarah Valley. Good evening. I have lived in Marietta my whole life and have just graduated from Marietta Valley High School. My mom has always ensured that I am involved in the community, including the library. Growing up, I've always looked forward to our week, at least weekly family trips to the library, where my mom would take me and my brothers to the library to check out our books for the week. We would sometimes be standing outside waiting for the doors to open, and as soon as we were let in, each of us would split up and find our favorite section of the children's section. I have many fond memories of times in the children's section, including spinning the wheel for the summer reading program, getting to talk with the librarians, and looking for books or movies, and attending various events throughout the year where I'd meet others in the community or make crafts. Once I was older, I enjoyed coming back to the library to volunteer and continue interacting with the children's library. Visiting the library was always something that I looked forward to and would love to see the library expand to extend its reach to even more children. With its already impactful programs, I know that expanding the children's library would reach so many children and let them experience the same joy that I did. Therefore, I encourage you to support the children's library expansion that will be greatly enjoyed by children for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Madam Mayor, I have, um, I have Mr. Kevin Kuhn has donated time, if you allow it, to Catherine Elliott. Do you yes, have like six minutes? Yes. Hi. Good evening, Mayor Stone, council, staff, and fellow residents. 
I am thrilled to be here tonight to share my passion for our extraordinary library and encourage you to look to the future of the library that our community will need in the decades to come. As you can hear, my children grew up in the library, not just the summer reading program, which is always phenomenal, and I don't know if you've been there since school is out, but it's just incredibly crowded. It's, it's a great place to be. Um, but we've also come for books and programs throughout the year. It is a welcoming, supportive, and safe space, something that is far too rare these days. As my kids grew older, I remember having to arrive early for programs, even back then, to ensure that we could actually get in. The programs were so wonderful that they regularly ran out of space, and this program has only become worse. Library programming has increased significantly in both the frequency and the variety of what is offered, but the community demand has increased even faster. Unfortunately, having insufficient space for programs, materials, and other resources is an ongoing problem. As our city grows and more high-density housing is built, much of it within just a mile or two of the library, even more kids and families will rely on the library to help them thrive. More space is vital to support the needs of our growing community and to host unique and impactful programs for kids of all ages, backgrounds, and abilities. As my kids left elementary school, they were excited to give back to the library, as you heard. It really was our second home. Through volunteering at the summer reading program, all three of them did that. It was actually like their first job. You know, we, they scheduled it and showed up and did it and looked forward to it. Expanding the children's area doesn't just impact little kids. It is wonderful for teens to have that way to benefit. And working with library staff was such a positive experience for my kids. And yes, we are that family, incredibly passionate library supporters on many levels. Um, I'm actually a lifetime member of the Friends of the Murrieta Library, um, as well as secretary of the Murrieta Public Library Foundation, and there's a number of us here tonight. Um, as he mentioned, we were founded in 2008, and it is actually a 501c3 nonprofit. And we were created to support the long-term goals of the library, and now is the time to be thinking long-term. This is such an exciting time for our library. We have the opportunity to determine the final shape of the physical building, to close our eyes and envision what can go into it and ensure that it can support the needs of our community in the decades to come. I really appreciated your support for the makerspace, something that is so near and dear to my heart. Um, a makerspace allows learning and creativity, as you mentioned, not just for the children, but for you and I and senior citizens. And I especially think of the men um, who'd be thrilled to be able to go in there and tinker around and learn new skills. Um, a lot of times, especially as they're seniors, they don't have the personal finances or living situation to have that equipment themselves. And a lot of them desperately need the social interaction that a place and the programming like that could provide. And I just think it could be incredibly wonderful. And I know you may not be able to outfit it immediately, but that is something, like you were saying, could be done you know, down the road, and we can find things like that. I have confidence that our incredible library grant writing staff and community donations will be able to fill that need. We just need the space. Um, hope, other hope for features like the inclusive furniture and the sensory wall that supports some of our most vulnerable citizens also wouldn't have to be completed right away, but we do need to have the space for that. Planning sufficient, flexible space for these features now will ensure that they will be there in the future. The benefits will be felt throughout the community, not just by the children. And I ask for you to vote to invest in our city's future and allocate the funds needed to ensure that this final build out of the library meets the needs of our growing community in the decades to come. On behalf of the Murrieta Public Library Foundation, I am excited to express our full support for expanding the children's area of our library. We are committed to working through the community to generate private funds to help fill the funding gaps, as Mr. Ambrose mentioned, I have faith that our residents and businesses in this city will come forward, but we need you to take the lead and envision the library footprint, say in 2050 or even beyond, and plan for it today. Thank you. Thank you. Karen Kiki Fritchie. Important to get that Kiki in there. I can do a full on Karen. You don't want to see it. I am Kiki Fritchie. I am the vice president of the Murrieta Public Library Foundation. I'm also 
the program director and board member of the Friends of Marietta Library. So thank you, Mayor Stone and city council members for engaging in this and being so positive about it. I love the questions, especially from Mayor Stone. I was disappointed because even a book is a butterfly. <laughs> I'm a visual and that was important to me, but the answer was no, that's okay. We can work with the interior of the library. The expansion is needed, it's wanted, and the vision of the future for our entire community. The foundation is committed to funding this project and we are seeking the help to private donors to meet our goal of $500,000. We look forward to a packet to give all the details and some of the changes that were made necessary in order to approach potential donors, private donors. These are people in the community that have the money that we need and they can afford. And they are children or their grandchildren attend the schools and use the library and always have utilized it. I am one of those people. My grandson is at Thompson Middle School and he has gone all the way through the school system. My son is a PGA tour instructor and the instructor, director of instruction at Bear Creek Golf Club. So golf tournaments have always been a way for me to raise funds. I do not take no for an answer. And Tom Landry found that out when I was on his board of Fellowship of Christian Athletes in Texas. So I was able to raise a lot of money. I like millions. I like that number. It works well for me. So we hope to approach people on a more personal basis as Mayor Stone is going to do. We're going to have some fundraisers in homes and at Bear Creek Golf Club, which is a private, the only and very privileged golf course in the Marietta area. So we are going to utilize these contacts that we have to raise these funds, and it's very important that we do this. Um, we look forward to you attending those events as well, and you, of course, will be invited. I have something that we sent out in our mailer. We are, as it was told, we are receiving some money already, so I will hand these to you to give to each of you, or if I may bring them up to you, you tell me what is best. And you can hand it to the city clerk. Thank please. you Thank so you. much. Thank you. That concludes public comments, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Madam City Clerk. I'm going to bring it back for discussion from the dais. Seeing none, um, I have a few things that I'd like to say. I, I, don't, I don't even have an Amazon account, believe it or not. People are like, they think I'm crazy. But I, I, I'm one that likes to touch, feel, and smell. I want to support our brick and mortar stores. I know how hard it is, um, especially to do business in the state of California. What's ironic with the type of um, internet and, and things that you can learn about on Google, it, it makes my heart so warm to see that the library is being utilized and how crowded it is. And the library is really truly the hub of our community. So it, it's very, very exciting, and I, and I want to thank each and every one of you for your hard work in bringing us what you brought us here this evening. So thank you so much for this. Um, Kiki, you talked about butterflies, and I envision butterflies within the library, and I love butterflies as well. Also, with regards to millions of dollars, I'm also, as a professional fundraiser, I love millions of dollars. And you know what? I would love to work with you to raise money for our library. So I'm inviting you into my sandbox. I like millions. You like millions too, so sir? Okay. Yes. Fantastic. Um, the other young lady, I, I can't read my writing. Um, you spoke about, you, you spoke so eloquently with regards to our seniors. And as you know, today, um, loneliness is the number one crisis for seniors. And having a place like a library, when you walk into a library, all you can do is smile and feel happy and engage. And so I agree with you. And then having, again, um, a facility for our youth. 
the library again is a hub of our community. And so I just wanted to say again, thank you to all of our volunteers and to our commissioner who also donates his time as well. Thank you for giving back to our community and allowing us to, be, to participate in your vision as well. So thank you so much. So with that, I'm going to give our city manager a few minutes to speak as well. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to take a few minutes to uh, thank these four staff members because I have made their life incredibly difficult over the last few months. Uh, their feet have been held to the fire on the budget until they're probably very singed. So with their help, they came up with a way to pull this off. Yes. And it's something that is to be admired and I'm very proud of the four of them. And I just wanted the council to know how hard they've worked to get us here tonight. And also, city manager, we want to thank you, too, as well. Um, you know, it, it, your, your leadership and your support has been very instrumental as well. So thank you so much. So with that, um, I'm going to call for a motion in a second. Shall we do it? Uh, I would like to make the motion for option B, but I'm not sure how to do that on here. It would be presented as option, option B. B. So I'd like yes. to go with the motion as presented for option just B. Just go ahead and, and okay. do your motion. Okay. There you go. Perfect. Motion by MPT yeah. Warren, second by um, Council Member Holliday. Please vote. Thank you. This motion carries unanimously 4 0. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, it's a long night. <laughs> Moving on to item number 20, resolution number 24-4763 to 24-4765, calling for the November 5th, 2024 general municipal election for districts number three and four. Madam City Clerk. Somebody who sat here was taller than I was. <laughs> this is where I, why I wear high heels. <laughs> Much better. I just heard that it's been a long night, so I'm going to do my best to convey this information as quickly as possible. Um, however, it is information that needs to be had, needs to be said. So we're here, um, I'm here to ask the council to call the November 5th, 2024 general municipal election. Um, it is familiar, a lot of this information will be familiar to the city council, um, but it is important that we get the information out for all constituents out there. Um, there's a map there for you of the two districts that are um, gonna be up for election. Um, it's districts three and four. So what I'm going to do tonight is give you a quick background. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the consolidation process with the county of Riverside. Um, we're going to go over a few of my responsibilities, and then we will hopefully conclude with a vote that allows me to do all of those things. So um, quick background. Um, so basically our municipal code requires that we actually hold um, our general municipal election, the first Tuesday after the first Monday of November in each even numbered year. So um, hopefully I got it right. And um, we will be having an election this November. Um, and that's just a reminder there is a quick background. So in 2017, the city of Marietta, this was before I got here, um, transitioned to by district elections. You were at large and um, you transitioned to by district. In 2021, um, after I started, actually, we did some redistricting based off of the federal census, as you know, and that's um, based off of the Fair Maps Act, um, all election um, related. 
And then in 2023, um, we had the annexation of the Murrieta Hill specific plan, if you recall. And so, yay, <laughs> Councilmember Laville. Um, and so that was annexed and um, we moved that into District 1, which is Councilmember Laval. And then here's just a quick synopsis of some prior elections that we've had recently and hopefully for community purposes, they could kind of see um, why we're back at um, districts number three and four. So in 2020, we had the general municipal election for three and four. Um, in 2021, we had a little bit of a, um, a shift. We had um, a vacancy, as you know, for district five. And so an appointment was done. It just um, was council, the now mayor pro tem Warren. In 2022, we held the general municipal election for one, two, and five, um, and that is now um, seated by Councilmember Lavelle and uh, Mayor Pro Tem Warren and Councilmember Holiday. And so here we are back, the cycle begins again, and now we're gonna be um, handling district numbers three and four. So I wanna talk about the consolidation process. Um, and so the California Election Code provides that um, when there are two or more elections within, basically I'm um, ad-libbing it, within the same territory, and um, they may be consolidated upon order of the legislative body, which is why we're here. And so for me to begin the consolidation process with the county, um, I must submit a resolution calling and giving notice, um, which is going to be one of the resolutions. I need to request um, consolidation from the County Board of Supervisors and request that they approve that. And then I need to actually have you all set regulations when it comes to um, candidate statements. So we're gonna, my deadline for the county is actually June 28th, which I didn't say. And so it's important that we, you know, um, try and deal with um, everything today if possible, but um, I don't foresee there being an issue. And I don't know why that's displaying all ugly like that, but, um, it's basically the title of the resolution, which I could read to you if you would like, but this is the resolution calling the general municipal election. Um, and this applies for any election to be held, whether it is standalone or consolidated. Um, it is procedural and it is required um, by California law. Um, as presented, it provides a procedure to resolve a tie vote by lot, um, of course, in lieu of um, having a special runoff election, which can be very costly. Um, and the resolution also affirms that um, as Marietta City Clerk, I'm actually your local elections official. Um, and that just kind of provides um, information when it comes to procedurally what I'm required to do and my responsibilities. So the second resolution is 24-4764, as you see. This is actually requesting consolidation with the county. So as you see there, the bullet points, um, I'm asking them to consolidate. I'm gonna let them know which offices we're seeking to consolidate. And it also acknowledges that they're gonna handle the consolidation in accordance with the same procedures of the statewide election. Um, I do wanna note as a local elections official, I do handle um, local responsibilities, but once we consolidate our county registrar of voters, um, he's relatively new. Um, his name is Art Tanako. He actually will be in charge of administering our election and he handles the canvassing and all the polling locations or vote by, voting locations and all that information. But we do um, partner and um, we collaborate throughout the entire process. And then the last resolution is, um, it's actually simple, but I need, do need um, direction because I am required to get this from you. It is regarding candidate statements. So um, the resolution provides regulations. We you know, provide, you can um, underline, whether you can um, bold, things of that nature. The county's really given me a guideline already. So that is within the resolution and it's worked historically for Marietta. Um, I also need to, um, as you know, candidate statements are optional. And so um, the cost is the responsibility of the candidate. So I need to make sure that the county is aware of that. And um, you can do 200 words. The election code actually defaults to 200 words, but this body does have the option to up it to 400 words. Um, prior to, I think, 2017 or 14. Prior to 2017, it was 200 words. 
Um, and then there was a shift um, from that, that then council and they shifted it to 400 words. And then when um, I came in, um, I asked the city council, the then city council, and they actually opted to continue with 400 words. There is a cost associated. I put in my estimated cost based off of prior invoicing from the county. So there's option A and option B. Um, and translation cost is to be determined, but that's if there's um, other translations that are requested from the candidate. Spanish is automatically done. Um, so the resolutions that are before you, this specific one, there are two options, A and B, one's for 200, one's for 400 words. Um, that's the only change in the, the only difference in the resolution. So um, before I move on, I do wanna ask, um, is there um, a consensus or any council input right now on word count for your candidate statements? Can you go less than 200? No. <laughs> Well, they can, they can certainly write less, but the maximum is they can do at least 200 or you all can um, up, up it to 400. They can do however many they want up to the maximum. Are, are, you, what are, what are, the, are you asking to choose one or the other? And okay. I'm asking you all to tell me whether you want 200 or 400. Less is more, but I, I, would, I would want 200. Okay. Um, 200 works no, for me. 200 no, works. Does not work for me. Okay, so um, I'm hearing, I'm seeing a 400. 400. I'll go with 400. <laughs> there you go. Um, so it sounds like we'll do um, 400 word count is really what the direction this council is going. Come on, council member Holland, uh, Lavelle. <laughs> My name is Lavelle. Um, yeah, I'll lose this battle, it's fine. <laughs> Thank you for that. So um, we will, uh, Mayor, as I think earlier I shared with you, we'll, um, I'll take the action at the very end of the presentation, but that pretty much covers um, the resolutions um, as a whole. Thank you. So now we're gonna move on to, as I indicated, um, as the city clerk, as your local elections official, I am responsible for a few core responsibilities. Um, that includes public noticing, um, making sure information is out there, verifications, um, accepting the nomination um, papers. Um, and so today, all I'm gonna talk about really is the nomination um, period, and then also just some upcoming public outreach. So the nomination period, um, and I'm gonna ask Kimberly to go resolve this slide because um, it's important that this state is there for um, the public to see, and hopefully she can do that. But I'm gonna verbally say it, it actually is July 15th, 8 a.m. through August 9th, 5 p.m. That is the nomination period. Um, I have actually received some interest and some questions from some folks. So I think it's important that I have this information out. It will be on the website. Um, tomorrow we'll be updating the website after um, you all take action. So it will be available. Um, and I do wanna note that any potential candidates are required to pool and file with me as a local elections official. Don't go to the county, they cannot do it, nor will they. And it can be problematic if you try to do that. So that's really what I wanted folks to get out of this slide. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, so there is the date there. So July 15th, 8 a.m. it opens and it closes August 9th, 5 p.m. Okay. So um, there are um, incumbents that um, currently um, are elected to District 3 and 4. Um, and so what the code allows is if um, the incumbents do not um, basically run that um, if they don't file, that it is extended. And so um, the deadline extended would be Wednesday, August 14th. And again, that's only if the incumbent does not file and um, it's not applicable um, for the incumbent to file if they didn't do it in time. So pulling nomination papers, as I indicated, the date is the 5th, July 15th through August 9th. Um, I do um, have folks pull papers by appointment. It is, um, it can be very complex. Um, it takes about 30 to 45 minutes, although I have spent a couple hours with a couple candidates here in Marietta. So, um, and we'll go over qualifications. Um, I'll issue the official nomination papers. I'm not pointing fingers, don't worry. And, um, and then any, <laughs> 
and then any additional filing, filing requirements. Um, it's really important that um, folks um, contact my office. They can call, they can email, and um, we will start taking appointments, scheduling the appointments um, actually tomorrow, and that will be on the website. Again, it won't be until July 15th, but we'll start taking and scheduling the appointments. And then they have, after um, they, the papers are pulled um, and all signatures have been gathered, the next step is actually filing the nomination papers with me. Um, they can schedule an appointment or walk in. I certainly um, encourage anybody to get to me any way they can to file their paperwork um, in the same manner in which um, they can contact me by my phone number, which is there, or my email. Um, expect 30 to 45 minutes. I'm gonna review and confirm some things, um, voter signature, um, process can begin. Um, I also want to note that um, I have had instances, actually several, to where um, folks come to me the last day of the nomination period and they file, they want to file, but they don't have all the information appropriate, and um, I can't accept it if it's not complete. And so they have to go off and then they're left maybe with a couple hours to kind of resolve it. Um, it does happen, but let's do, I wanna do my best to make sure that doesn't happen to any potential candidates. And then I'm just gonna quickly talk on some election outreach that we plan on doing. We'll be um, attending some events. Um, social media, Christina has been great with working with us on trying to get a cycle of some election outreach. Um, we're gonna be doing signage. Um, the county signage tends to be a little, I'm gonna use the word bland, it's easy to miss. And so we like to um, market Murrieta appropriately. And so there's a sign, there's one of an example that I did a um, couple years ago. Um, and then also we would like to be informed of candidate forums. I've already been contacted. And so I just want the information to be put on the website so folks can know who's having forums and if they wanna go participate or watch or, or not. And then I also wanna note, you know, we um, attempted to do a first time voters academy. Um, we think election season is the time to do it. Um, there was not enough interest at this time and so we're gonna probably push for it in the fall. Um, but that's something that we're gonna try and attempt some more as we attend these events to try and get a little more engagement from um, the community as a whole. And as I mentioned, um, I do have a partnership with the Registrar of Voters, um, and he's actually, as new as he is, he's actually been very um, responsive to my office, and we have um, inquired on several things, and he's been very responsive. So I do wanna let this legislative body know that about art. Um, so um, I've been working with them on potential um, permanent ballot boxes, not for this election, um, but it is something that I want this council to know that I'm, you know, proactively doing and moving forward and thinking about the future. Um, I sit on an election observer panel with the county and also an advisory committee on accessibility to voters. And then also um, we partner with them and we of course are vote by mail, drop box and some vote centers we have here in the city. And then that's here designated vote sites. It will be City Hall, Murrieta Public Library, Fire Station 4. Um, so yeah. And now I'm just gonna ask Kimberly just to talk a little bit about the website and what um, potentials can expect. Alrighty, thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, my name is Kimberly Ramirez, I'm the Deputy City Clerk. And so the slide before you is actually gonna be our landing page for the November General Municipal Election website. And the goal of this website is to be a resource for not only residents, but all community members alike. And I'm not gonna go through every single item that we have on the website. I know you guys really wanna hear it, but um, I'm only gonna go over a couple things. Um, for one, is gonna be noticing. It's only gonna be specific to the election, so it's not gonna have any public hearing notices or ordinance adoption summaries on there. Um, we also have um, nomination papers issued. Um, this is gonna be a notice of everyone who's pulled any nomination papers or who has filed who qualifies, so all that good information is there. Um, it's gonna be updated every 24 hours. Um, we will also have campaign filings available on there and for ease of the public, it can be separated from 
the election that you're looking for um, by candidates, um, the PAC, it's all there and accessible. Um, the last thing that I want to go over is some candidate resources. We're going to have general information available as well as a candidate finance toolkit that's provided by the Fair Political Practices Commission. And all of this information is going to be um, found under a little hot button titled Interested in Running for City Council. Speaking of interested in running for city council, um, thank you for that, Kimberly. So I first want to say that Kimberly actually handles the website um, for the clerk and um, specifically for elections. And she's really, in the couple years that she's been here, she's made some um, valuable improvements. Um, and sometimes folks don't see what goes on behind the scenes, but she puts in such a great effort to making sure that folks um, get the information that they want. So. Um, I, I just want to thank her for that. Um, and so with, with that, I want to talk about um, something that, you know, this is my second election here in Marietta. And um, so the first one, there are some lessons learned for the clerk, right? And I think it's important that, you know, I say that and that um, what I would like to do is, as I mentioned, I would like to do some pretty robust public out, outreach but we also would like to hold a, an informational um, interested in running for city council type of um, forum. It's just informational, it's on procedure process. But what I did learn um, during the election was that um, you know maybe I wasn't conveying all of the information um, from whether you, re you really are interested and if you are interested what the potential looks like, what the actual being a candidate looks like and requires what a being a council member actually looks like, right? What the expectations are. And uh, maybe from you know beginning to end, just kind of provide that information. So it's all very procedural. It's all informational only. Um, it's not for support in opposition of anything other than just getting folks interested. Um, I can tell you, I did have some um, folks pull papers the last election. And um, they came back and they said, God, being a council member, it seems like it's kind of a lot of, you know, to do, a responsibility. And so I really wish I directed them to maybe look at being a commissioner because being a commissioner can be a really good um, step towards um, contributing to your community, but also a step towards, you know, is this something that I want to do as, in the future as a council member? So it really is just to talk about um, what it looks like for them and what the expectations are, and maybe I'll drill down a little more than I did with um, the three of you that's, that I, I assisted um, um, a couple years ago. And so um, I wanted to let you know that's what I intend to do. It'll be held the week of July 8th. I'm gonna do it obviously before the opening of the nomination period. Um, and just if anybody's interested, I want them to contact us, but we will be putting things on the website and Christina will help us get the word out on that. And so um, with that, I am available to answer any questions. Um, and then after that, I am asking the city council to adopt the resolutions as provided, including um, option B for the third resolution, which is 400 words, if that is the pleasure of the council. And um, that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Madam City Clerk. And we're gonna go ahead and take questions. Uh, Council Member Holliday. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just wanted to thank you both um, for your hard work and dedication towards this effort. I know you take it very seriously and I appreciate that. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Council Member Holliday. Council Member LaBelle. I just wanna echo that. Uh, I, you were, Obviously, you handled my election. You made it very easy, painless, and you explained everything as I needed it and wanted to offer up. Um, if you need anybody to help you with that informational service about actual experiences of a council member, I'd be happy to shed some light on that for the audience. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you, Council Member Lavelle. Um, seeing no other questions, um, we will call for a motion and a second, please. Motion by Council Member Lavelle, second by Council Member Holliday. Please vote. Motion carries unanimously, 4 0. Thank you, Madam City Clerks. Appreciate it. 
Moving on to governing body announcements. Governing body announcements is an opportunity for the council to, to provide miscellaneous reports and announcements. Announcements should not exceed two minutes and the city clerk will use a computerized timer. And I am requesting for my colleagues if I can have council member DeForest two minutes. Thank you, I have consensus. I apologize, Madam Mayor. I just realized um, on the last item, there were no public comments. I just want to note for the record. So may you repeat, I apologize for um, what was just requested. Oh, I'm so sorry. Is there any public comments with regards to resolution number 24-4763 to 24-4765? Seeing none, Madam Mayor. Whatever, seeing none. Thank you, Madam City Clerk. <laughs> Okay, moving on to governing body announcements. We're gonna start with Council Member Lavelle. I actually do not have any announcements. Okay, Council Member Holliday. Thank you. Um, I attended the evening of innovation that was put on by the Chamber of Commerce that I, I know Madam Mayor did. I don't know if any other colleagues there. Yeah, I was Lavelle. Just sure. Lavelle was there. Was Lavelle was there? I'm the worst, I'm sorry. <laughs> you just said you had nothing. <laughs> doesn't even remember being there it was a great <laughs> evening um i appreciated it some very very impressive people presented at that uh, event i thank the chamber and patrick for putting that on um i went to our as most of us did went to the mirada police department's uh promotion and swearing in here at city hall uh always an impressive event an impressive group of people so I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, and with my colleagues, we walked around the Father's Day car show, um, which I had been involved in uh, back to the Murray Valley Foundation I was involved with back when we brought it to Marietta because it used to be somewhere else. And then we brought it to Marietta and glad to see it's the 50, 55th, 53rd, I don't know. It's way up there. Um, but it's been around a long time and, and uh, Got to educate Madam Mayor on cars and carburetors and oil bath air filters. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a lot of fun. And then this morning, I attended the Menifee Police Department swearing in award ceremony where several of our dispatchers, who we dispatched for Menifee, received awards and, and acknowledgement there. So good job, PD. That's all I have. Thank you, Ma Council Member Holiday. MPT Warren. Thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, on June 13th, I uh, attended the Marietta Wilmar Chamber of Commerce networking breakfast, and Patrick, it was outstanding. Nicole did a great job, and I know that her information is going to help a lot of our businesses um, file their taxes a little more appropriately, probably. <laughs> um, on June 13th, along with Council Member Lavelle and my two esteemed colleagues to my left, uh, we all attended the Marietta Police Department's promotion and swearing in, and Captain Gomez, outstanding group of men and women who serve our community, and it was an excellent presentation. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you for including all of us. Um, on the 14th, I attended with uh, two of my colleagues to my left, this salute to the elected officials dinner um, put on in Lake Elsinore. And then on June 15th, um, after I went to the car show, I ran over to the Trader Joe's new location and took a picture because I felt like I needed to go to the window, go open, 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 like the Mervyn's commercial. Um, they looked like they're getting really ready and it was really cool to see that all going on. So that was very exciting. People were wondering why I was taking a picture and I just, I just smiled because there was so much parking around there. It's just amazing. And the last thing I did attend was the car show and I had the honor to represent our council and pick the mayor's choice. And I went with the 57 Thunder Ford Thunderbird, the one on the very right of me, might be your left. Um, it, what a beautiful car that was. And uh, that was a car, the same car that my grandmother had. So was, uh, this one is just amazing. So it was very fun. Thank you for the honor of doing that. That concludes my report. Thank you, MPT Warren. Um, you can review my governing body announcement on our website, but there's, there's one topic that I, I, I wanna share. Um, I was a guest of Lou Monville, who chairs the Ag Ag Advocacy Committee Foundation 
for San Marcos. And I want to talk about the Higher Education Collaborative. Higher education, I remember back in 2007 when former mayor council member Chuck Washington talked about higher education. And then Matt Ron, Matt Ron, former mayor and council member of the city of Temecula, he ran on higher education. That was his platform. And he is the one that negotiated with Abbott to purchase the building where our higher education or Mount San Jacinto resides now. It was not an easy task. It took a couple of years. And because of his leadership, that came to fruition. Alan Long, former mayor, council member, many years ago, he was in collaboration with Temecula about higher education. And recently, Councilwoman Lisa Sobeck and their former economic development, Gina Gonzalez, brought forward to the Women's Elective Collaborative to talk about our regional goals. And there were a lot of regional goals that we had talked amongst all five cities. But that was the one issue that kept coming up to, to the surface. So Lisa Sobeck, Gina Gonzalez, um, contacted San Marcos. All five cities participated and collaborated with San Marcos. And it really got a lot of movement. And so we decided to allow that to move away from the Southwest Women Collaborative and, have, and be their own committee. And I really want to thank our own council member, Lisa DeForest, who is chairing that committee along with council member Lisa Sobek, who is her co-chair. And then lastly, at the event on Saturday night, they honored Chuck Washington, our county supervisor, for allocating ARPA funds of $5 million towards the efforts of the tenant improvements that we're looking for um, for the higher education for San Marcos. In addition, my understanding is I think the city of Temecula also has donated a million dollars. When we started this, we, we, we needed to raise $10 million. And as you heard tonight, with inflation, the cost of materials, if we can even get it, we're looking at $18 million for the higher education um, just in a short few years. But where I'm going with this is it takes a village, as you know, and it takes lots of conversations, lots of partnerships, lots of vision, and a lot of hard work. And for the last 17 years, it's finally happening. It's finally coming to fruition. And there may be a, a lot of other people that have been involved in this process that I'm not aware of, but more importantly, I just want to say thank you to everybody that has touched this vision for our region, and I really believe um, it's going to come to fruition. So I just wanted to give acknowledgement where acknowledgement is deserved, and you can read the rest of my governing body announcements on our website. And with that, we're going to move on to the next item, council member request to add or withdraw items for future agendas. Now is the time for council members request to add or withdraw items to future agendas. There will be no discussion on the request. A brief explanation of the request may be given. The merit of the items being requested may not be discussed or debated. Now, are there any requests from my colleagues to, uh, for a future agenda item? I have one. Uh, I'd like to talk about the rotation policy, as mentioned, for um, Mr. Klein and Mr. Long. Just want to bring that up here, talk about history, and what, if there's changes we want to make. Okay. Uh, do I? Yes. Madam City Manager. So we have that um, on the agenda for the upcoming council workshop. Did you? I don't believe we could get it probably sooner than that with being dark. Is that um, when is that again? I'm sorry. Uh, July. 
July 20. So we have a meeting, um, one meeting in July, and then the workshop towards the end of July. And just for clarity, the workshop will allow public testimony or public comment. Yeah, or it's questions. on the agenda. Yes. meeting. So okay. I want to let me ask you a question, Sergeant City Manager Summers. Um, this is just a, a, a policy, a discussion, and a, a potential pol new policy potential, depending on the discussion. Um, do we want to take time away from the goal session meeting when there are lots of priorities versus just doing a quick little discussion at the next meeting? The next meeting is very full, mm -hmm. um, but let me look at it and see if we can squeeze it in there somewhere. Okay, because as you said, we are going to go dark, and you know, if we, being that we're going dark, I think that the goal session meeting should be for high priorities and if we can do the people's business on july 2nd for an extra few minutes i think we should be able to do that okay. yeah if i i would actually if it, it takes more than 20 <laughs> minutes to talk about this i'd be surprised so i mean if it's if it would take more than that i would defer to pushing it to the uh workshop but I'll leave we need, we need consensus first. We need consensus first, Madam City Clerk. M Madam City Manager, could I say something? So, um, so as the clerk, I track you know some requests from council, and I work with Kim on making sure that stuff gets brought forward. So there are some things um, that other council members have asked to be brought forward, and it all falls under one resolution, which is procedures and rules. So it's mayor rotation. It's how to bring items on the agenda. It's the six minute request versus three. And so we were taking it at the workshop as something that we thought you all wanted to discuss so we can get some clear direction on how to move forward because it is a rather large policy. It's not just a policy on the rotation. Got it. So okay. I Thank just you want you to be aware of Thank that. Thank you for the clarification. On, on that note, I just want to make sure that entire uh, grouping of policies and procedures, will the public be there for that as well? Yes. Okay. All right. That's fine then. Okay. So do we? Oh, so it's already it's already on the goal. Okay. So then I remove my request. Thank you, thank you so much. Are there any um, future agenda items that need to be requested? Seeing none. Um, before we adjourn tonight's meeting, we hope that all the fathers in Marietta were able to have a wonderful weekend with their loved ones and a happy belated Father's Day to our city staff. So with that said, we will now adjourn.